Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you all indulged in a good, a good lunch. So we shall proceed to continue with the rest of the sessions. We will be moving on to the third session, titled Climate Change, Risks and Resilience. The session will be chaired by Mr. L.V. Krishnan, former director, Safety Research Group, Indra Gandhi Center for Atomic Research, Kalpakum. We have a lineup of expert speakers, namely Professor Dr. Adluri Subramanian Raju, Dean, International Relations and Professor, Center for South Asian Studies, Pondicherry University, Dr. Sufiya Khanu, research, a Senior Research Fellow, Bangladesh Institute for International and Strategic Studies, and Mr. Omar Rajaratnam, Fakram Foundation, Sri Lanka. I would like the dignitaries to please uh, occupy the dais. I would like to invite Mr. L.V. Krishnan to deliver the chair's remarks and introduce the distinguished speakers. Good afternoon. I hope you have uh, had good food for the stomach. Now I think you are going to be in turn for a good food for the brain, for the mind. Now the session is having three keywords, climate change, risk and resilience. No politics in this. But there's a lot of diplomacy is also involved in this. Now Severe consequences of climate change or global warming as it is called. These are being felt all over the world. It could become worse if the response in the world is poor, which turns out to be the case as of now. The risks that would follow and the urgency for action is perhaps better understood now. Now various solutions are being considered for resilience, not so much as to prevent climate change, because I think it is going to be very difficult after having delayed for so long Although maybe experts delivered a warning three decades ago, four decades ago, at the time I think it was said that no, no, climate change is not happening. That's what some of these countries did. Now I think it can only be steps towards resilience. So I think it's appropriate that the session has these three keywords. But historically, People of the global south in particular have survived since ancient times by use of renewable resources. The oceans were a large part of it. Trade across the oceans also has been taking place going back to 2000 years. Now, increased <coughs> resort to ocean resources is seen as an option even by the developed world to help reduce carbon emission and work for sustainability. So blue economy is a newly coined word. It has become the buzzword now. Now it's a recent term and it means many things to many people. It has various definitions. For the original meaning of the word blue economy, I would refer you to the book by Gunter Pauli, published in 2010, and his list of 100 innovative solutions for combating climate change. That book deserves a good read and perhaps the concepts mentioned therein deserve strong support. Our focus here 
in this meeting with the global south to understand the areas where the countries of global south desire assistance and examine how to help these countries what does blue economy mean for the global south and what are the expectations of these countries this decade is called the ocean decade and this is the third year of the ocean decade that the world is going through <coughs> by the end it take a intense 2030 that will also be the year or the target for the united nations sustainable development goals this was set up 3 decades ago so it coincides with this now we hope to get to know more about blue economy to begin with from professor as raju i hope he will tell us about what assistance india can offer also to the global south in developing blue economy he is the editor a versatile author and an editor of many books each of them a collection or a compilation of views from various authors it's not an easy job to coordinate these authors their work and put them together in the form of a book but he has done that not just one several of them now the second speaker would be <coughs> somebody from bangladesh since its independence 50 years ago Bangladesh has had an impressive growth compared to many other countries of the global south even though it is not endowed with energy or natural resources commensurate with its population but Bangladesh has great hopes of diversifying beyond the ready made garment industry for its economic growth by making optimal use of its coastline success requires of course a very healthy marine environment and professor dr sufia kanom is a research associate at the bangladesh institute of international studies has been with them for several years healthy oceans is actually a topic of special interest to her the third speaker with no land connections to another country sri lanka depends entirely on an import by sea for its needs and likewise export for its products but this is natural hazards there are concerns about those caused by human actions example illegal unreported and unregulated fishing is one such spread of plastics in the oceans which actually move up the food food chain into the fish is another loss of net in fishing the important source of these plastics municipal dispersal of waste is transport now is primarily through large container ships some of them are humongous in size while this enables huge reduction in shipping cost there is another side to it that brings risk experts show by data analysis that accidents to containers on board the ship are not uncommon they are fairly frequent but they also go on reporting many carry harmful cargo 
that is unreported or misreported even. Accidents to these can cause harm to sea life and disrupt fishing activities. Sri Lanka had such an experience two years ago. Perhaps Mr. Rajaratnam, a journalist of wide experience, <laughs> would tell us about it and discuss ways in which India can be of help in extending prompt assistance in such cases by way of subsequent cleanup operations. As you know, India was one of the first countries to extend such help in the case of tsunami in 2004. Now let me stop here and invite the speakers first to begin with Dr. Raju so that I don't take too much of their time. Let me end here. Thank you, Chair. Let me at the outset thank uh, Commodore Watson for uh, the opportunity given to me to be part of this event. And also I request the Chair to give two minutes extra for my presentation because my presentation, uh, mine is a PowerPoint-less presentation, so please consider that. And uh, my presentation is on the challenges and opportunities of a blue economy. And this is the recent discourse where we are talking about how blue economy is so important, particularly for the coastal states. In the view of uh, climate change, how it is uh, posing multiple threats and also rise of sea level, which makes the, con the coastal states to have a concern over how to protect the environment. In that sense, when you are talking about how that is going to be, but then before uh, discuss about the relevance of blue economy, how developing blue economy is more concerned for the coastal states. Let me also focus a minute on relevance of oceans because unless we know the importance of oceans, it is going to be difficult for us to look at how important to concentrate or to focus on blue economy. When you look at the ocean, which is instrumental in connecting people, connecting civilizations, connecting cultures, connecting people, connecting governments, which makes us to think that every coastal state, irrespective of the location, is a neighbor to the another coastal state. That makes us to think how important the ocean to us. And also 85% of the world is representing with the coastline and 45% of the population live near the coast and two-thirds of the population live within 100 kilometers of the coastline. And 80% of the coast uh, capital cities and international uh, trade centers located near the coast. And when you look at 36% of the world encompasses within exclusive economic zone. 95% of the world's trade conduct through waters. In other words, when we look at whether it is a coastal state or is a hinterland state or landlocked state, invariably they have to depend on waters for their trade. And also when you look at 5% of the world's ocean have been explored so far. That means in other words, 95% of the exploration of the resources available on waters. And uh, sea is seen or sea has been instrumental in connecting all parts of the world and maritime has become a dominant factor in global affairs. When we talk about this, invariably, I think in the previous session we are talking about that deglobalization. Some of the countries in the world are having a problem with the globalization. I think this is a time for us to navigate the idea of maritimization of the world instead of focusing on globalization because most of the trade goes through waters. Hence, the how ocean is so important for us. So, maritimization of the world makes us to think about our future lives in waters. And also the topic on which I am supposed to talk on Global South and Blue Economy, where we have 106 countries of Global South are having coastline. And also Global South represents 
2,35,597 kilometers of coastline and also 6.89 million square kilometers of exclusive economic zone. Therefore, we have reason to look for developing blue economy in global south. And blue economy, why it is so important, as I mentioned to you, and also this is something where we need to look at how that is going to be eco-centric economic approach and also it focuses on improving human well-being, social equity, <laughs> reducing environmental <laughs> risks and development with sustainable dimension. And also in the recent past we look at that how global supply chain crisis which had impact on the globe. I think uh, this is one aspect where blue economy will really address. In that sense, when you're talking about blue economy, will address so many problems. It will also try to reduce social conflicts. It also try to look at encourage for exploration of resources by local and consume or consumption by local people. In that sense, we we'll talk, talk about the sustainability that could be seen in the near future across the globe. And there are different factors, there are different sectors where we talk about blue economy, the fisheries, one is uh, one of the sectors which has a long history other than other sectors like shipbuilding, ports, or coastal tourism, mining, blue energy and maritime security threats. And it is also, it has been operation in isolation, fisheries one sector which has been seen in isolation like other sectors and this is the time for us that the economy will advocate to have a kind of uh, coordination with other sectors mainly to minimize uh, expenditure and also enhance uh, revenue <laughs> and also we need to look at how this economic lifeline for many coastal states which depend on fisheries and also when you look at the population which we are expected by 2050 we are going to witness uh, 9 billion people then probably we look for more fish. If that is the case then previously and also the chair is also talking about overfishing or, or illegal fishing how we are going to address. I think this is somewhere we need to look at that the economy makes us to think about how coral reefs are mangroves which are really important for breeding and feeding grounds for fish and also apart from illegal fishing or overfishing the climate change also has impact on fishing or fisheries if the temperature raises two degrees celsius then probably we will lose 41 billion dollars of revenue by 2050 so thereby we need to look at how this blue economy advocates to look for how the sustainable kind of the situation which makes us to protect the fisheries in the near future. And also the collaboration between the countries in global south is very important in terms of fish, though fish is the activities within the state, but it needs to look at the collaboration in terms of sharing knowledge and to look at what uh, really the great demand in market and what are the uh, free, what kind of fish can contribute to more revenues and more nutrition and what kind of techniques that can be used uh, to prevent illegal fishing. That mind we need to look at how this uh, fishing or cooperation among the global uh, among the countries in global south to cooperate and coordinate in terms of sharing knowledge to improve or enhance the fishing catch. And also the other aspect of blue economy is the shipping, which is also very important for us and it is seen as the cheapest, <laughs> fastest and the safest mode of transportation. And also it is really reducing climate change. When you look at the statistics which makes us to see the cost of moving goods from coast to coast through shipping, it reduces or it contributes only 21% of road transport and 42% of rail transport. So this is somewhere we look at how shipping is contributing 90% of goods to 8 billion people at the moment. Thereby we have to look at how shipbuilding could be a really a 
kind of uh, 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 important sectors of uh, blue economy. If you look at in the Indian context, we know about during the 5th and 10th centuries, how Malacca states were under the Vijaya Empire, and also British, when British, before British came to India, this is, uh, we are known for 800 to 1000 kil, or, or, or tons capacity of ships used to be built by our seafarers. But then, if you look at the statistics at the moment, what is India's contribution in the world in terms of shipbuilding? So that is only one percent. <laughs> so I think this is the area where India needs to look at. It is that we need to, we have no reason to lag behind South Korea, China and Japan who are leading uh, in, in shipbuilding in Asia or in the world for that matter. But then we have capacity, we have affordable labor, we have uh, thriving steel industry, we have skilled workforce, but then we don't have domestic capacity to boost uh, demand for shipbuilding because it's not that only 1% of contribution of uh, shipbuilding by India, but 65% of Indian cargo goes through foreign ships. I think this is the area where blue economy or uh, the emphasis should be taken in particularly in shipbuilding where India needs to improve shipbuilding from 1% to at least 20-25% knowing about our historical experience somewhere we need to look at we need to rectify and ports can be also another aspects of blue economy that is something which serves the link between uh, uh, ocean and land transport and if you look at again again if you look at in indian context we don't have natural <coughs> ports uh, though we have uh, a long coast but then we don't have but then there are studies which talk about to have a uh, Campbell Bay in, in, in Andaman Nicobar Islands that could be probably seen as a natural port but then there are some reservations in terms of environmental to be protected in Andaman Nicobar Islands thereby we have reservations but otherwise we need to look at how these natural ports which are also really helpful and particularly if India is looking for making that uh, this is what the uh, Prime Minister was talking about 5 trillion economy by 2025 and 10 trillion economy by 2030 probably we need to look at to improve these uh, different sectors of blue economy and <clears throat> coastal tourism there is again a global industry and it is 80% uh, of tourism that uh, you know, takes place in uh, coastal areas and it is employing uh, in, uh, employing one in every 11 people globally <laughs> and this is also again depending upon the tourism can be improved only because you know depending upon the environmental quality if that is missing then probably <coughs> we will not be able to attract more tourists and that really boosts local income, it will eradicate poverty and also enhance livelihoods and promotes better local management and conservation practices. <laughs> and if you look at cruise tourism, there is another aspect where the countries in Global South could really collaborate and cooperate each other to promote because that is uh, where we can look at the 150 million billion dollars annually that is really uh, 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 come from cruise tourism and that is something where we look at but then if you look at the statistics India received tourists of uh, 10.4 million whereas Thailand attracted 35 million people in 2017 if you look at the coastline it is not even half of the India's coastline uh, you know represent by <coughs> uh, Thailand I think there, I think India needs to look at and also India needs to collaborate with other countries in Global South to promote tourism that will really enhance the, the economy of uh, uh, each country or uh, uh, each coastal state. And the another aspect of blue economy could be blue energy which is also very important essentially the theme in which we are here talking about climate change. I think that's something we have to shift our energy consumption from from <coughs> fossil fuels to non-fossil fuels and thereby we have to look at because we cannot talk about climate change without addressing energy security or energy consumption so we need to look at how and India's consumption of carbon dioxide 70% it comes from thermal energy so I think we need to revoid the energy policy 
not only by India, by other countries, uh, particularly the developing countries in global south. So in that sense, we need to look at how that, and apart from addressing this climate change or, or reducing the rise of sea level, it is also very important to look at tidal and wave or ocean energy will really help us to access, to uh, allow access to uh, energy by isolated communities, which are in different parts of the country. And maritime security equally is also another aspect of blue economy, which is very important. And when you're talking about <laughs> threats like uh, maritime <laughs> piracy or maritime terrorism or illegal or tra trafficking or, or other trafficking uh, uh, dimensions, but also look at the plastic as mentioned by the chair and also look at about the coastal erosion, which are also very important on the oil uh, spills if it is that has also happened in 2017 in the in in Kamaraja ports which also had affected the marine waters so and also rise of sea level which is also equally important for us by 2050 it is expected that uh, 250 million may become climate refugees i think that is going to have impact on different sectors like fisheries trade or 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 tourism so that is something where we need to look at how climate change and blue economy are going to be <coughs> having an impact on each other. So piracy, that is another. <coughs> According to World Bank estimates, piracy costs the world economy about $18 billion a year. <coughs> and also piracy is uh, somewhere we look at about the uh, Somalian pirates who are able to, you know, ex uh, able to go to up to 700 nautical miles, whereas uh, every coastal state has only jurisdiction of over 200 miles. So look at these, the kind of the capability where they are exercising more than the uh, coastal state according to the uh, unclass C, only 200 nautical miles is given to the coastal states. And particularly we are talking about blue economy exercises, so the sectors are there known to us. Blue clusters is very important for us to look at, to avoid, to coordinate the different sectors, to minimize the uh, expenditure and also enhance the uh, revenue. That is something where we need to look at blue clusters. Otherwise, most of these, most of these uh, sectors are working in isolation. And the particularly marine spatial planning, which is also very important, which is not, uh, 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 it, in, it is in the national states uh, in India and also most of the uh, countries in global south, where, where it really contributes to uh, identify mapping resources. A single location can be designed for multiple uses because even it, it varies from place to place, the priorities of blue economy. In one place, uh, fisheries may be in abundance. In one place, it may be tourism may be attractive. In one place, it will be a, 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 a constricting a, a, a port. So this is all we need to have that uh, coherent, safe and sustainable human activities in seas and oceans that probably will really uh, uh, make us to think about how to develop uh, MSP and private sectors is also very important uh, aspect where we need to bring. But then the moment we talk about private sectors, because the blue economy talks about uh, sustainability and growth, how both can go together. So that is something where we need to attract. How do, how do we attract them? That is something. But what are the challenges if you look at, because the priority changes from place to place, from state to state, then how we can coordinate each other in terms of developing blue economy and also audit of revenues from sea. It is also very difficult because we don't know how much revenue we get from the different sectors from ocean and also variation of resources <laughs> we do not know and also uh, mapping resources this is also very important uh, look at that that is also still we are not in a position to help the the stakeholders and attracting uh, the private sectors and uh, and also power exploitation how we are going to look at on one on one hand we are talking about growth on, on the other hand we are talking about sustainability sustainability will not allow us to go for exploitation of or over exploitation but then how do you look at how do we make it balance so that is also another challenge and know how technology is also very important when you are talking about uh, developing blue economy investment and collaboration so finally i conclude i have two minutes extra. 
So oceans uh, are seen as the last frontier and needs to be careful in exploring resources and oceans represent a new economic frontier for growth. And <clears throat> we have to have look at this, the, com the, 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 the ocean wealth and ocean health because this is the next presentation is on ocean wealth and ocean health because we cannot extract wealth from ocean unless we have uh, a healthy oceans. So this a combination of health and wealth should go together in that what context. I think MSP will really help us on one hand growth, on the other hand sustainability. So that is what we have to look at. And also the countries, I think this is the time for a country like India, as we have demonstrated as a president of G20, where we have in, you know made envisioned our 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 <laughs> motto about the one earth, one family, one future, our oneness our universal brotherhood, our Vasudeva Kutumbakam and also we came out with the, you know, practically we have come with the international solar alliances because we have a problem in mitigating GHG emissions but then we have taken it because it is, you know, uh, it is a global problem is our problem. See, that is what the conscious in our approach towards the uh, 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 world. So that's something where we need to look at the Samudra Mantan as we know very well about the turning of the sea because we have to navigate this idea across the global south to talk about it is not that you know the state versus state but uh, states need to work or uh, fight against the threats uh, which are emanating from sea so that's something where we need to look at how that could really and uh, india needs to of course india is seen as uh, representing the voice of the global south and also we are able to uh, you know articulate in the g20 presidency where we have given impression that India is not only rule taker, but it is also rule maker and rule shaper. So I think this is the time for a country like India to take a lead in developing blue economy for global south. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Raju, for that uh, fully comprehensive account about the blue economy and uh, where India stands and what India can do. Now I call upon Dr. Sophia Kanam to speak about Bangladesh. First, I'd like to um, thank uh, the Chennai uh, 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 Center for uh, China Studies for inviting me and uh, as a speaker for this uh, uh, for this August <laughs> gathering. Uh, so uh, I have uh, prepared the presentation. Uh, I was thinking that it is the after lunch session, so everybody will feel sleepy. So I made my PowerPoint quite colorful, not like the other slides. Hope you will enjoy. You will enjoy, not enjoy my presentation. Maybe my slide. <laughs> so with this, uh, I think uh, I would like to start my presentation. So I have slightly changed the title that was uh, given uh, by the organizer. I have uh, slightly changed the title of my presentation. So the present title uh, of my presentation is "Impacts of Climate Change and Pollution on the Bay of Bengal: um, Healthy Ocean Ecosystem uh, and Livelihoods Perspective in the Global South." I have taken the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean because Indian Ocean is vast. For this type of presentation, I would like to rather focus it on the Bay of Bengal, how climate change and pollution is affecting the health of the ocean and how it is affecting the biodiversity, ecosystem and the livelihood perspectives. So with this, um, so I have divided my presentation into three parts. In first section, I would like to uh, discuss about the healthy ocean and why it is important for us, for the global south. And uh, for the second section, I have uh, I will discuss about the climate change issues and the pollution issues for the Bay of Bengal. And for the third part of my presentation, what would be the regional cooperation and what would be the challenges for those regional cooperation. So with this, I would like to first uh, describe that what is the healthy ocean and how it is important for us. So um, 
healthy ocean uh, ecosystems are those exhibitly normal form and the function that is demonstrating sufficient organization, vigor, and resilience to allow ecosystem to exist, thrive, and evolve as a natural system. And according to the Ocean Health Index, the, the Northwestern Pacific Ocean is the least health, and the Western India and the Central Atlantic are the healthiest, which is who is also barely passing the great point 67 out of 100. So we are calling it healthy, but actually this is not healthy. And, um, and if we uh, uh, concentrate on the second point that why health, uh, healthy ocean are um, necessary for like connected with the human security issues, because ocean is covering about seven percent of the earth as sir said earlier and ocean regulate um, climate and provide us with food energy and livelihoods and ocean mitigates non-renewable industrial pollution uh, by absorbing 25 percent of all carbon emission of the earth while generating 50 percent of the oxygen we need to survive which is more than the production of amazon and um, <laughs> It is, an, uh, it is an important source of biodiversity which is providing jobs, food and livelihoods for many people. And ocean provides all the well-being benefits to all humanity based holidays uh, are close to the water and ocean water. And it also has the therapeutic properties due to the high presence of sodium, iodine, calcium, potassium and magnesium. It is great for our skin, respiratory system reduces stress and increase red blood cell, reduce pain and appearance of celluloid and supports our thyroid system. So if we concentrate on the um, Bay of Bengal, the Indian Ocean is the third largest ocean and often uh, referred as the Great Middle Bay. And Bay of Bengal as the largest bay in the world is referred the center of the Great Middle Bay. And it is 2.2 million square kilometer of northeastern <laughs> part of Indian Ocean and underneath a part of Great Indian Australian Plate. And it is one of the world's largest biodiversity, as I said before, and produces 6 million tons of fish, which is 4% of the total global catch. And more than 20% of the global population actually lives on the five coastal countries of South Asia. And strategically, Bay of Bengal is also very important. It is an economic highway for the commercial shipping and shipping routes between the eastern and the western hemispheres. About half of the world's container traffic passes through this region, while ports handle approximately 33% of world trade. So this is also very much connected with the ocean pollution, which I will discuss later. And the enormous amount of hydrocarbon deposits in the Bay of Bengal and its littoral, such as Sumatra, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, Brunei, increase its strategic importance because of this availability of the hydrocarbons. And Bangladesh is also believed to be abundant hydrocarbon reservoirs where Japan, US, and India can assist actually. So, uh, what are the causes of the healthy ocean? First, climate change and and uh, the plastics and the ocean debris and uh, fishing, excessive fishing and fishing gears and the ship breaking industries and the transports and offshore uh, drilling and deep sea mining. So uh, these are some of the uh, uh, like uh, studies that was. Uh, done by some of the researchers. I have just uh, picked those pictures. This is not my research. So this is the climate change projection of the Bay of Bengal. If you see this figure, the, uh, the temperature is rising of the ocean surface uh, over the years and it has a, a huge impact on the, on the health of the ocean. So in the last 45 years, sea surface temperature has risen by 0.2 to 0.3 degree Celsius and it is projected to rise further by 2 degree to 3 degree centigrade by the end of this century. And as a result, the sea level is expected to rise about 37 centimeter by 2050 and salinity will increase and will destroy the existing coastal habitat. 
And uh, if I um, uh, mention one of the examples, the glacial lake outburst floods in Uttarakhand's uh, Chamoli district in February uh, 2021 because of the Nanda Devi glacier actually broken off and it was a huge um, uh, disaster in the um, uh, downstream countries and in the in the ocean as well. And um, and because of the temperature rise. The tropicals, the intensity and the frequency of the tropical cyclone will also increase. And um, if there is excess number of, um, uh, and it, it, you will see the, you know, the sea level rise. If the sea level rise, <laughs> then the green part of this map will be inundated. And now the purple part is already inundated due to the sea level rise. And. If you uh, see this figure, that uh, that how these tropical cyclones has been increased over the years, and if you see that uh, the num the if there is excessive number of carbon dioxide in the air or in the atmosphere, uh, it dissolves with the water and cause the acidification of the sea, and it causes the pH imbalance of the sea. So, um, and um, uh, and when the pH Im uh, imbalance uh, is happening in the sea surface or in the uh, in the ocean, then you will see that there are a lot of um, you know um, uh, there are a lot of uh, impact uh, will be seen in the even in the mangrove, in the other biodiversity, and even in the plants. If you see the picture here in the um, uh, left side, you will see that how it is affecting the coral leaves of the ocean. And uh, uh, if we uh, summarize that the impacts of climate change, it will loss of land due to the loss of uh, uh, due to the uh, lot of coastal erosions, and then the, the biodiversity, it will lose the loss of biodiversity, huge amount of, and it it cause um, uh, destruction of the infrastructures and loss of lives, not only the human beings but also the other living beings. And uh, because the the vulnerable community or the people, those who are living in the coastal belt, they are actually vulnerable. So they are they are forced to migrate or they are displaced from the their place of origin. And when they are migrating in the new place, there is a conflict over the limited resources. And there are some other issues because wherever they are migrating, the destination areas, especially the city centers, are not very much you know welcoming this. Uh, forced migrants, and there are uh, there are several studies that there are some security issues there. Maybe their number of in, uh, crimes increases over the time when the you know the migrants are coming uh, or starting to uh, live in the new uh, in the destination areas. And uh, if you see the impact of marine pollution due to the plastic uh, and uh, due to the marine debris. <coughs> Uh, you will see that um, uh, about um, uh, you will see that red um, uh, red areas of the of the map. You will see that this part of this world is very much uh, prone to the you know the uh, the plastic pollution and and. Uh, And um, uh, there are some uh, statistics that um, that uh, the Bay of Bengal, because of the funnel shaped and the wind direction in the Indian Ocean, actually this part receive uh, you know huge number of uh, plastic um, bottles and the plastic materials every year. And there are also um, uh, and this plastic convert into the microplastics and this microplastic this, the most dangerous thing is that microplastic actually mix up with the food chain of the um, uh, of the ocean system. So whenever we are consuming the um, uh, food from the ocean, it is actually entering into the human bodies and creating lot of problems and lot of diseases um, in the in the um, uh, in the people, those who are dependent on this type of food.
and uh, if I um, and uh, uh, if I consider the fisheries uh, of the Bay of Bengal, um, Raju sir already has mentioned about the um, uh, fisheries and about the blue economy aspect. But uh, uh, I just want to add here that the fisheries are one of the you know in the Bay of Bengal are under pressure also, and many um, uh, many of the um, species is already extinct like and also are in the danger like the shark the grouper the croaker and uh, and the rays um, have, have uh, are, are extinct already so uh, in 19 uh, if you see the historical perspective in 1960s the western aid agencies encouraged the you know the trawling in uh, india and in bangladesh in the indian subcontinent so the fishermen could uh, profit from the you know the demand uh, for the prawns in the foreign market and this led to a pink gold uh, rush uh, in which uh, the prawns are trawled with the fine mesh and um, uh, nets and that are dragged along the sea floor but along the hulls of the this pink gold uh, these nets also scooped up the whole um, sea floor ecosystem and although it is um, now discarded but uh, today the collateral damage of the trolling industry is processed and sold to the fast growing poultry and um, uh, aquaculture industry so of this region and um, in effect the sustained pay of bengal fisheries are being destroyed in order to produce dark cheap chicken fat and uh, the fish fat fish feed and uh, uh, one of the and uh, I think uh, we are much we are talking about the um, uh, transportation we are talking about the uh, you know the tourism industry based on the blue economy but one study by the European Federation for Transport and Environment found that 63 cruise ships emitted about 43 percent more sulfur oxide than all the two, 291 million cars in Europe in 2022. So, um, and Bangladesh, uh, you know that Bangladesh is very much um, uh, famous for the ship breaking industries and you will see the statistics there and Bangladesh imports around 3.5 million tons of crude refined oil from which 4,000 to 6,000 tons are dumped annually into the Bay of Bengal. And again, ship breaking years are dumping about 22.5 tons of uh, polychlorinated biphenyl, which is uh, which pollutes about 20% of the water and sewers of the around uh, 40 million people who are living 19 coastal districts of Bangladesh. So there are also offshore drilling and deep sea mining is going on around Bay of Bengal, Shangu uh, offshore gas field of Bangladesh, Kutukdia offshore gas field and exploration of beach sand deposits are also uh, you know um, uh, the, this type of activities are also happening and causing um, uh, the destroying the health of the ocean. So not only the uh, you know the uh, the pollution and the climate change and all of the things are very much connected with the security risks of the of the people and uh, for the state we, uh, if we consider it as a state level there are some of the security risk is also there so regional interested military competition can be you know um, can be evolved and forced migration will be conflict uh, driver and land land loss as a conflict driver because Bangladesh is very much densely populated so it will create definitely a conflict and climate change threats overall the displacement community resilient because uh, whenever new people are coming the existing resilience actually broken down and then again threats in the national government and uh, governance and the security because government is not ready to support this type of huge displacement and then again the strategic assets are highly vulnerable and um, there are some of the bodies that we can regionally cooperate and I think the BIMSTEC is one of them. Uh, we have Bengal Multisectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation and BIMSTEC Center on Weather and Climate has potential to work on the regional cooperation on the environmental issue. 
and um, then uh, Bay of Bengal Large Marine Ecosystem Project, which is funded by the Government Environmental Facility in Norway, Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, the National Oceanic Administration of the USA FAO, and um, and the other organization like Bay of Bengal Intergovernmental Organization on Coastal Fisheries and Agency under FAO, and Bangladesh, India, Maldives, and Sri Lanka are also engaged with this. Um, uh, uh, this uh, this framework and they can work together and SARC initiatives of the Bay of Bengal and SARC cooperative environmental um, program SASEP was established in 1980 to, to support protect management and enhancement of the region and uh, there is another ASEAN I'm not going into details otherwise I could not finish it so and then again uh, HIGO framework of action 2005 to 2015. So these are the uh, regional framework that where Bangladesh, India and the other South Asian countries who are very much connected with the healthy ocean can work together. <laughs> And there is uh, some of the examples uh, between Bangladesh and India where they are working together. Of course, the Ganges Treaty is one of the uh, successful, I think, diplomatic initiative that Bangladesh and India has done very successfully. And there are some of the coastal policies that Bangladesh has and India also has. In 2011, there was a memorandum of understanding between Bangladesh and India on the Shundarbans, on the protection and the management of the Shundarbans. So this is another, uh, I think, a good uh, symbol of of, you know for a bilateral cooperation and this is the example of the international laws that where we can work together by following these laws but there are some challenges if you see this table because not all the countries are signatories but most of the time India and Bangladesh are signatories in the same uh, you know the policies of the law so there is some scope but maybe which is not applicable for the other South Asian countries and then again I have mentioned some of the challenges although there are a long list of challenges but I have summarized some of them like regional cooperation and the human security in the Bay of Bengal is actually theoretically possible and uh, the discursive focus on the climate change within regional organization like BIMSTEC on the bilateral discussion is reactive and even specific so and we need MOU and we need long term cooperation this picture is clumsy. I just want to show you that these are the negotiation blocks in the COP, where actually all the countries, uh, and uh, you, we know that recently the COP28 has finished, uh, is uh, uh, finished, and uh, if you see this uh, figure, that Bangladesh and India is, you know, negotiating in the different blocks in the uh, in the climate negotiation uh, uh, negotiation forums. And if you see the international climate regime, uh, there is a, the, if you see the pink circle of the, of the climate regime, where CVA, Bangladesh and other South Asian countries like, uh, like uh, Nepal, like Pakistan and Maldives is also the member of the CVA, but India is on with the basic countries. So I think this is one of the major drawbacks for the regional cooperation of the, of the South Asia because here, India is actually uh, making uh, alliance with the other countries like Brazil, South Africa, China, but just to minute. <laughs> and uh, if you see this uh, 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 this uh, climate regime, but the climate vulnerabilities we are facing, the South Asian countries are very much connected with each other. But when we are negotiating in the international forum, we are negotiating in the different blocks. So I think this is one of the major challenge. So we should need to think about the other way of, uh, you know, so that we can negotiate and we can work on the common vulnerabilities. So these are some of the policy suggestions. So I'm not going through this as I'm running out of time. So these are some of the policy suggestions that the South Asian countries can uh, actually follow for better, uh, cooperation and I think uh, finally I would uh, conclude uh, my presentation with a quote from Einstein like if we do the same thing over again and again we will get the same result and uh, so we need to change the policies we need to change our vision 
and uh, perhaps maybe from the bilateral to regional uh, approach so that we can grow together. So with this, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you for your patience sharing. Thank you all. Sophia for a wonderful presentation, which uh, started with uh, the sources of pollution, but also came up with a lot of suggestions about how to interact among the South Asian nations and with the rest of the world to the betterment of this region in particular. Thank you. Yeah. Omar Kajal. Thank you, Mr. Krishna. Um, firstly, thank you to uh, Komodo Asan and the team at C3S uh, for the kind invitation in this extremely well put event. Um, I'd also like to thank the audience in advance for not falling asleep during my session. Um, I'll probably take about 10 or 15 minutes. So if you want to sleep, you can. I won't cry, but uh, try not to. So um, firstly, I think uh, I'd like to touch upon some of the comments that uh, um, Mr. Krishnan made as well on disaster resilience. Why do we keep talking about disaster resilience and not prevention anymore? Is it because it's too late for us to talk about prevention? You know, have we, have we passed, has that ship sailed? Um, and this is exactly at which I'd like to be the talking point of my presentation is uh, disaster management and resilience in the Indo-Pacific slash again Global South as the, as the conference books it. But one area that I'd really like to focus on because also the media experience that we have is making the grassroots communities affected by these disasters, prone to these disasters, vulnerable to these disasters, a meaningful stakeholder in counteraction. Um, and this is something that we cannot underscore enough because in most parts we speak in policy forums, we speak at government levels, we speak at many top levels. But the voice that also is most underrepresented in most of these disaster resilient uh, fora or any real policy fora is what does this mean to the grassroots community and whether we are adding them and including them in our solutions, in our discussions and coming up with solutions that are actually <laughs> favorable and actionable by them. So, uh, let's go on to the next slide. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. So, um, that's the abstract. Um, again, we don't, I think I've actually summarized it um, in a uh, fairly um, crisp. So, I'll move on to the next one. What is actually the Indo-Pacific and why is it so important? Us, right? So the Indo-Pacific accounts for nearly about a third of the global global do, uh, domestic product, and it's expected to uh, expected to account for around half by 2040. So that number alone should actually tell us how important the Indo-Pacific is to us. But it also is important because almost half of international trade happens in the Indo-Pacific. It's either passing via a ship, it's either actually happening via a digital economy, but it happens in the Indo-Pacific region. Number three is of course that the Indo-Pacific is also, unfortunately, the reason for some of the most disaster prone areas that's ever known to humankind. Um, why is this important? We also have a lot of islands in the, in the Indo-Pacific that we need to actually focus on, but then we will actually try and move on to the Global South, especially the G20, which is also the premise of this conference. Um, again, it's a population of nearly about 4.7 billion people that live within the G20 nations. Um, as the Chennai floods would have highlighted just last week, but also like the Sri Lanka floods that disasters has highlighted, we do have a huge issue with asset, con on asset concentration. It can be uh, unplanned constructions that we allow to, to come up, it could actually be a massing of a lot of these con uh, constructions and our assets. <laughs> this concentration is extremely risky for the health of our environment, but also for the health of um, anything that we have to do in these countries. Um, the, the third statistic there is fairly scary actually. Four out of 10 most vulnerable countries on the World Risk Index in terms of disaster 
is among the G20 nations. So it's all good that we want to build a coalition between the G20 nations, but we also must take into account that we are in extremely fragile footing. But this is also something that we can do something about, but the figure actually states how scary it is and, uh, and how risky it is the path ahead that we have. But even worse is the loss, the annual loss in terms of a disaster to our average, to our collective economies. We have nearly about 218 billion USD annually that costs each of our G20, uh, I keep saying each of our G20 nations, but then again, G20 is a lot larger, Sri Lanka is not part of. Uh, but um, so th this is something that, that also needs to be taken into account, right? Um, yeah. um, why is also then again, we'll go back to the Indo Pacific a little. Why is it important? Nearly 225.3 million internal displacements are re were reported in the Indo Pacific between 2020, 2010 and 2021. I think Mr. Krishnan and also uh, Professor Subramanian Raju was talking about climate refugees. This is exactly what we are talking about. Uh, there may be some uh, differences in the classifications that we have, but it, regardless, it does run the risk of nearly 225 odd people being displaced over the past 11 years. Again, weather related hazards make up for nearly about 95% of the regional disaster displacements, and, uh, which is also caused by climate change. The Indo Pacific is also in the most active seismic region of the world, right? We have the Ring of Fire. Um, but because of that, I mean, we, we also talk about Indo-Pacific, we also speak of countries like Sri Lanka, like Mr. Krishnan pointed out, we are not connected by land to any other country. Uh, we are also not in a seismic region, but that has not spared us by the disasters that we've also kind of faced. Both uh, natural disasters, we have man-made disasters, we have disasters that has come out as a result of security, security drills as well. So as the point also says, Sri Lanka has experienced a spike in tremors in the last five months. I mean, we've been affected by not earthquakes. We don't want to actually call it earthquakes because we are still not there. Um, our uh, seismologists have actually said that Sri Lanka will face earthquakes uh, fairly soon. Again, their predictions. But we've seen a, a rise in torrential rain, unprecedented rain, actually. We've seen a lot of floods. We've seen fatal landslides. In the last five months, we've had so many landslides in almost every hilly area of our country that it's for the first time we've had multiple rail tracks that had, been, that had to be closed off completely because of landslides. We are not a country that's not new to, uh, we are not new to landslides, but, but this level of scale and severity is the first time we've actually seen in 2023. But again, we're talking about disaster resilience. Could we learn something from partners like Japan? like partners from India, on how do we stay ahead of this curve? How do we minimize harm to our nation, our citizen, our economy? By bringing in disaster resilient learning, disaster risk mitigation, or disaster risk reduction education into it. This is also something that I'll, I'll, I'll uh, tell one. Um, and of course, when we talk about Sri Lanka and its disasters, there is no conversation to be had without India's involvement or India's role in having to come to rescue Sri Lanka almost every single time. And I think um, most of Sri Lankans will agree with me that more every Sri Lankan actually is extremely thankful that we have India to our rescue. Uh, but we also realize what kind of a burden that can be to a country. Uh, that is also, again, a bigger power to us, but they have to keep coming to our rescue almost every single time. The slide there actually shows some of the key uh, events that have happened. The 2004 tsunami, in which India launched Operation Rainbow, came to humanitarian uh, disaster relief for us. There was a lot of tents, camps put up by India that came to our, uh, that was ex extremely helpful for Sri Lanka, which had one of the biggest fatalities of the 2004 tsunami after Indonesia. Then, um, fast forward to uh, 2020, we had the empty New Diamond disaster, which was a huge crude oil tanker that was off the east coast of Sri Lanka um, that, that actually ended up in having um, an oil spill. Again, who was it that came to rescue us uh, or offered assistance initially? And consistently, it was India. And we must also note at the time when India was assisting us, 
these uh, assistance was not built, so there was no compensation that they sought from the Sri Lankan government or the state for the services that they provided. The same was repeated in 2021 when we had the Express. There was another ship called the Express Pearl, a Singapore flagged tanker or owned tanker, in which we didn't actually, it was not a crude oil tanker, but there was also an oil leak because the ship sank into the bed fairly soon. Uh, and this, I think the point that I'm about to make in terms of equipping the grassroots communities in being literate in how to deal with these disasters is fairly key in this instance because when the 2021 disaster happened, there was a lot of, most of Sri Lanka's beaches affected by this disaster looked extremely beautiful. It was almost, because Sri Lanka normally has very beautiful beaches, but then on these days, after the ship disaster happened, you could almost see like white pebbles spread all over our beach. Uh, so our, of course, citizens, the fisher communities, grassroots communities didn't think that these chemicals were actually hazardous. And there was also sacks and sacks of chemical uh, waste that was washing up the shore. Again, people didn't know that these were chemically hazardous because they look extremely beautiful, these little white pebbles. So they were taking this by the sack to their homes, probably with the hope of thinking that we can sell this stuff off. By the time they realized and by the time that messaging actually went to them that what they were carrying home in big sacks, uh, fighting with each other and still carrying them home was actually hazardous, even if you left it at home. You don't have to do anything about it because these were chemical chemical goods that we were not supposed to come in touch with. This, to me, is really the bedrock of disaster resilience or the importance of us having to work with grassroots communities, making them aware uh, via public uh, information campaigns. I don't think is going to be sufficient anymore. We have to have targeted, niche-based public interest content that we create around disasters, how to prevent disasters, how do you actually react to a disaster when it happens, how do you stay safe when a disaster like this happens, right? Of course, we can't blame the grassroots communities and say, well, why did you not think that these were hazardous for you and why did you actually take these uh, sacks of white pebbles home? They don't know better, and it's up to us, it's up to everybody in this room, it's up to everybody um, in the Sri Lankan state, in the, the researchers, the policy makers, the media, to be able to keep them informed about this stuff. And uh, of course, um, I, I also talk about vaccine shipments that came during 20, uh, from 2020 to 2023 under the Vaccine Maitri program, again, with the leadership of India. But despite all of this, there is still a lot of misconception at the grassroots about disasters, how that affects them, what they can do to keep them safe. And for most part, there is also a lot of misconception about Indian assistance in Sri Lanka as well. And um, in the next slides, and we'll also try to get to that, why that is. Um, why, why is India also best place to be able to assist us? India itself is a country that can lead by example. It is also a country that is disaster prone. And under the G20 presidency of, um, of India, it's also going to head the working group on disaster risk reduction, which also means that for Sri Lanka, there is now going to be something more systematic to look forward to because our disaster management center or our government were not placed to be able to come up with a wider plan that can matter to all G20 nations as well, that can be applicable to Sri Lanka. But soon probably that will be history. Of course, the framework of it and how the uh, implementation uh, work plans for it or the roadmap is still not drafted, but hopefully that will be of use to Sri Lanka. Um, again, one other thing that we want to also highlight is that uh, India's reputation as an actor in the global stage to be able to provide humanitarian assistance, be it disaster prone or be it human made or man made, has really also been able to build a lot of confidence among Sri Lankans, among the Sri Lankan systems as well, that we can actually uh, look to some protection again, but we can also have uh, proper examples in which we also uh, have an opportunity to follow the lead of India both as the G20 presidency, under its G20 presidency, but also separately. So, um, what type of activities do we have 
to be able to uh, become disaster resilient or know about disaster resilience. Of course, there are national initiatives in Sri Lanka as well. We have them in India um, as well. Like, uh, like we've mentioned some of them here. Um, we have the National Institute of Disaster Management and Incident Response for India. When it comes to Japan, we have the Civic Spoke Force of Japan and the Aerospace Exploration Agency. And for Sri Lanka, we have the Sri Lanka Disaster Management Center. Bilaterally, we have also the Triangular Development Partnership, which is also called the Trident Partnerships amongst India and US, but also it targets disaster uh, resilience. Um, again, uh, a name that we cannot forget uh, in terms of those uh, disaster resilience, also the China Pacific Island Countries Center for Disaster Risk Reduction uh, and Cooperation. When it comes to multilateral stuff, where there is more than two countries involved with it, we of course have the Indian Ocean Rim Association that works on disaster resilience. We have the Quad, which was also allied after the Indian Ocean Tsunami in 2014. And also, like uh, uh, Dr. Sophia was actually mentioning, we have the ASEAN Agreement on Disaster Management and Emergency Response as well. But these four, actually, the is also key because we were talk, trying to also see what happens at policy level mostly. Uh, we've actually come up with the four stages or the four C's of, of the continuum for collective disaster management here. We have communication there. Of course, uh, we have cooperation, we have coordination. We have collaboration there. Um, on all of this stuff, and uh, I, I'm not going to go through it with, uh, one by one, but in all of this stuff, one thing I want to highlight is how much we miss out on messaging all of this to the grassroots community. <laughs> the grassroots community most affected by these disasters don't get to feature in this framework. We talk of communication amongst two actors, we talk of communication between two, two countries, two organizations, we talk of coordination between governments, we talk of collaboration, we do not talk about bringing in the worst affected populations to these conversations. This is a real problem. This is also something I want to highlight. Uh, we then move on to another framework that also has the uh, Asia Pacific Alliance for Disaster Management. This entire cycle that we have here, um, again with uh, the mutual help, humanity, transparency, good governance, willingness, and um, all of those cycles there. Excellent for policy level, excellent for state to have, again, one actor really is missing here, the grassroots community is affected by it. The reality is that in all of these conversations, for years in end, and this is also probably why this is a problem, we have to talk of resilience now because we can't, we are too far on the prevention because we've ignored the grassroots community's literacy or we fail to package it to the grassroots community in a way that they understand consistently so that they can become stakeholders in disaster resilience. Then, but I'm not going to actually touch on this, I'll just go right to the uh, takeaways and uh, recommendations. Number one, what can we actually do? Invest, invest, and invest in disaster risk education. This is something that is extremely key. If we, when we talk about literacy, we are not talking about the ability to write of the citizen or the ability to read. Sri Lanka, of course, is known to be have uh, over 85% uh, over of literacy in South Asia. Uh, our last consensus on that was done in the 80s. So we have not actually conducted a census on our literacy rates for the last nearly 40 years. And I'm sure we are down to about 65%. Uh, but, but this is also the thing. We tend to go by old statistics for new problems, and we really need to actually look at innovative ways of not doing that. Number two, to support disaster, uh, disaster risk mitigation practices at the grassroots. Again, this is also uh, enshrined in the Sendai framework uh, from 2015 to 2030. Um, you can also look it up if you, if you want because there's not enough time for me to cover it. Enhancing data collection. Enhancing data collection, yes, at the grassroots level. When you share it, you also make sure it goes back to the grassroots so they know what the problem is, they know how they can actually be meaningful stakeholders in this. Again, strengthening regional collaboration, it's fairly straightforward. We, again, uh, this is also something my fellow panelists brought up, making disaster resilience more socially inclusive. This is also something that we, we really need to uh, 
we, uh, there is a lot of focus that is needed on this. But one thing I will also kind of, uh, uh, what I want to highlight is, when Sri Lanka, of course, had its Easter bombings, then we had COVID, then we had the ship disasters, and then when we thought we are about to recover, of course, the 2022 economic crisis hit us. Most of the good systems that we were trying to actually fix or set up by that time, a lot of it has been reversed already. People, and this is also again just to the grassroots communities affected by this, it's very difficult to talk disaster resilience with people who are more focused on finding three full square meals for their children. Sometimes to them, when we start talking about disaster reduction or disaster resilience, or climate resilience, it actually sounds like a first world problem. Because the question they ask us back is, why would I care? I'm, more, I'm actually more focused on getting the best square meal. This is something that we really face badly with the economic crisis. And I think Sri Lanka will take about another four to five years before we can actually come out of this. Uh, mentality, and I think uh, panelists before were actually highlighting examples from Sri Lanka, um, but this is also something that affects our disaster resilience framework and our capacity to be disaster resilient. So, last but certainly not least, I'd really like to leave you with one mark. Um, we are in a digital world. We have a lot of YouTubers here, probably people famous on Instagram, formerly famous on TikTok here as well public interest content that can be packaged or that can break down really, really complex messages about disasters, about regional cooperation in bite-sized pieces so grassroots communities can understand this is key in us being able to fix a lot of these issues. And especially in this climate space and disaster resilience, circular economy, blue economy as well, like uh, Professor uh, uh, Subramanian Raju was mentioning, this is something that we're reading. So getting creative, becoming consistent, and having collaborations <laughs> in for public interest content creation around disaster resilience is as important as any of these policy conversations that we have today. Thank you very much, and thank you for not falling asleep again. Uh, thank you. Please also indicate to whom the question is addressed. Yes, for sure. So this is Janvi from Loyola College. Um, so my question is addressed to Subramaniam Sa. So um, it is said that the human society has mapped more accurately than ocean flows and that we have barely exploited its resources. But our marine ecosystem has been heavily degraded not only by direct marine pollutions but also via indirect marine pollutions like ocean acidification, etc. like my map explained, which is a byproduct of other forms of pollution, be land or air pollution. Also, oceans play a vital role in regulation of climate and pressure system. So, despite all these things, is it possible to ensure sustainable development via blue economy without causing any long-term marine degradation? Because Sir was explaining about tourism and shipbuilding and all, but they all actually end up causing a lot of pollution and with respect to those things. So, yes. Any other questions? Um, Hello, I'm from Royal College. Um, so, my question is to Dr. Sufia Khanum and Mr. Omar Rajvatna. Um, you talked about livelihood and resilience, uh, respectively. So, one thing that I found missing in the presentation was the unfolding crisis of climate migrants or refugees. The title that we haven't decided for them yet. We have uh, Ushenia Islands like Kiribati and Tuvalu who have sent their own percent of climate refugees into Australia. And the global south, most of the countries, as uh, Mr. Omar mentioned, is very prone to climate related events and disasters. Maybe. We just have the global compact for migration and that does not really deal with the people moving out due to climate change. And 
Mr. Kumar also mentioned that we do not involve grassroots level the indigenous people that are affected by the events but they have their own coping mechanisms which they have been historically following now that the acceleration of climate change which is for a large part they are not a fault of um, they are they are the ones facing it so my question is for to bridge the gap between global north and global south the most easiest and the most approachable way is, is economic growth but if we talk in lines of climate change, that economic growth is something that will accelerate the side effects of it, leading to the unfolding of uh, events like people moving from one land to another land where 60% of their own country has submerged their claim us. That's my question. Thank you. Okay, we'll take these two questions. The people have these two questions. Um, well, thank you for those questions. Again, right throughout these sessions, we've had very sophisticated, well thought questions. So thank you for that. Um, when we, when I rather spoke about grassroots communities being left out. I was certainly not referring to only indigenous communities. When we talk of grassroots, we're talking about the lower income groups, the ones who actually find it difficult for their livelihoods, but also any community that doesn't have access to fora like this. Um, again, it was also not an attempt to try and pass the blame of climate um, impact on them, because like you rightly pointed out, right, they are not the reason why they have to suffer this. But in terms of <coughs> bridging the gap, one thing, it's, it's also very difficult to be able to say, okay, this is the exact solution that we have in bridging the gap. But tailoring any concept or only choosing what works for us is extremely important. This is also something we feel like, you know, with, with the G20 coming into this being the bargaining power for us to be able to tell the global north that not all of the solutions that they prescribe to us is actually actionable to us in the grassroots is key. That probably is going to form the first three points of having to say that. I also refer you to because we've actually seen climate activists like Greta Thunberg come up, a lot of the things. It's, it's all good that we want to actually support this stuff. The reality is that they've actually, they've achieved the economic growth that they want because of industrialization we are facing the brunt of their economic success. So, so to turn around and tell the Global South now that we need course correction, frankly, the Global North doesn't have the moral responsibility or the right to prescribe that to us. But for the Global South as citizens to be, it's also not something that we can adamantly reject because the reality is it's also our oceans that's getting, that, that's getting polluted. So tailoring a solution here or having that bargaining power to be able, to, again, to say this is what the Global South think and this is the level to which the Global South can adjust. Beyond that, we can't. Let me give you some examples from Sri Lanka. Uh, there was also this thing about, there was a lot of medical waste, hazardous waste that UK was transporting to um, Sri Lanka, where we had to actually figure out how to, how to dispose them off. Two years ago or three years ago, Sri Lanka basically told them, this is not going to work. Malaysia has done things like that. So in any case, we feel, and I, I just want to reiterate, there is an issue. We can't afford to be adamant or arrogant about it and say the Global North actually had their, had their fair share, so therefore we are going to do what we want. The reality is the Global South also deserves access to prosperity. And if we are going to have to make some tough decisions in, able, in being able to negotiate that, and some of them are invariably going to have an impact on the economy. Our solution or our approach should be how best to mitigate it. We probably are not in a position to stop it completely. Thank you. I hope that answered you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I just uh, want to mention that So uh, I just want to mention here that uh, maybe I have skipped the information like 
there are about um, 50 million people will be displaced in the in the global south from the global south by 2050. And uh, you know uh, that there is no um, uh, I think there is no legal uh, 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 legal um, uh, uh, how can I say there is no uh, legal definition for the climate refugees because it is not covered by any law. Because when they are displaced, like for Bangladesh, there are a huge population, they are displacing like from their uh, place of origin to they are coming to the city, but they are not crossing the border. Unless and until the people, they are not crossing the border, they cannot be referred as the refugee according to the international law of migration and refugee. So global compacted migration actually doesn't actually work for the climate migrants. And you know that migration cannot be happen for the single reason, not for the environment. Like if there is any cyclone, like in Bangladesh, I can give one example. Like after the Isla, people, uh, the, their houses, everything destroyed. And then, they, then again, they try to settle down there, you know. Then the second disaster comes and they are more weaker than the previous one. And uh, when they are like facing several disaster, they don't have any other option rather than migration. So this is actually a very uh, vicious cycle of you know the poverty and uh, and many other things. And uh, regarding the you know the global north and global south, actually, if you see like it is very unfortunate. Like I'm from also from the research institute and from the academia. It is very unfortunate for the global south that we are not much talking about the global climate change politics and the diplomacy. So if you see the literature of the climate change from the authors or the, or the researchers, those who are doing research on the climate change, most of the literature you will see like mitigation, adaptation, which is focusing on. But very few literature you will find that is focusing on the climate security and the global climate change politics. Like few years back, I was trying to do some of the systematic literature review on climate security, and I was trying to see the you know the politics around you know the climate change regime. Unfortunately, I didn't find like five to ten article which is actually based on the global south and is based on the global climate politics. So I think we need to, uh, you know, focus on the global climate change politics. We need to understand, even if you see the emission data, like you see, US was the, uh, you know, the highest emitters, like maybe 30 years back. But now China and India are the highest emitters. What is the reason behind it? Is it like the US GDP's growth has been down? No. Because they have shifted the industries. Now the developing countries, you don't know, the US companies has established their factories in the developing countries like China and India. And so the emission level is going high for the developing countries. But you know, and if you see the literature, most of the European uh, authors and European scholars are writing about the climate security, climate justice, climate negotiation and climate diplomacy. So they are actually running the, you know, the politics around the climate and climate fund. So I think from the global south, we need to think about it. We may be negotiating the different blocks in the COP negotiation, but we should have our own, you know, the regional cooperation where the South Asian countries or the South Asian vulnerabilities, we can solve our problem in the own way. I think that's the, um, I think the main gap is the knowledge gap because we don't know what we need, to, what we should do. So I think we need more research on the global climate politics to, you know, to um, present our need in the, in the global arena. And uh, I think I have covered most of the uh, thing. And uh, if you have any other questions, so we can talk bilaterally. If, uh, if the activities of different sectors of blue economy are going to are, are going to contribute to environmental degradation, probably that is what we look at. Blue economy advocates that uh, there should be 
a kind of a link between ocean wealth and ocean health. And Blue Economy is not promoting tourism the way we are witnessing in the, across the world. So there are regulations where they have to follow, where they want to improve or enhance the activities like tourism or fisheries. There are kind of regulations which needs to be. And also this is what exactly MSP is coming into picture. We have to have the protecting the areas like that. That is something very important for us. And also, <coughs> it also talks about mangroves, coral reefs, and how that are going to be protected, how to improve instead of, you know, uh, remove them. So there is what the consciousness among us to look at about uh, developing blue economy is not that easy, but it is not that difficult to look at because we have no alternative other than opting blue economy or developing blue economy. In that sense, we are talking about how to protect the environment, how because even if a tourism, the tourist will not be attracted by us if environment is not good. The quality of environment is also seen by the tourists. So in other words, this is what the blue economy talks about that environment to be protected, how these coral reefs and mangroves are also not only helping for breeding and feeding for the fish, but also attracting the tourists. There's a combination of, uh, you know, multiple benefits if you initiate to have the, you know, a uh, kind of uh, approach towards uh, protect the biodiversity that will really help. So in that sense only we need to look at uh, how we can understand developing blue economy. Thank you. Last question, Professor. My name is Surin Narayan. I am involved with C3S since its very inception. My question is to Sri Kenfeld. You rightly highlighted the necessity to educate the stakeholders, sensitize them about the problem, and also involve them in finding an amicable solution. I am involved with one issue which vitally affects the livelihood of Sri Lankan fishermen and Tamil fishermen in Tamil Nadu as a result of poaching by the Indian fishermen in the Sri Lankan waters, use of toggle which are banned in Sri Lanka, the various criminal activities, mudding the waters, etc. There have been meetings between the representatives of the fishermen on both sides and I've been involved with some of them and the Indian fishermen in one meeting agreed that we will withdraw the dollars within a specific time. But when the Sri Lankan Tamil fishermen came to Chennai for a meeting, the Indian fishermen were influenced by the political parties and then they started raising non-issues like at the Tivu and various other things and the talks faced. The problem here is not the non-involvement of stakeholders, but the intransigent attitude of the Tamil Nadu government and political party. It's supposing the Sri Lankan government goes to the International Court of Justice, as Philippines did in the case of China against China, the fisheries issues in the South China Sea. The judgment obviously will go against us. But the fishermen, Sri Lankan fishermen rightly complain that Colombo is more interested in befriending India rather than protecting their interests. I would love to know your interests. Would you like to know the views? Would you like to know what you think? So uh, that's, that's a fairly contentious one uh, because it, it, it has been ongoing for, for decades now. Um, Like you also rightly pointed out, there are agreements that when the fisher folk, uh, when the fisher associations come to Chennai and have discussions, then then when uh, Chennai fisher associations come to come to Colombo and have conversations, there have been violations on both sides. I think I'm fairly okay to say that because there these are again we come back to the grassroots community tab. They are not going to honor agreements 
that are that are met within that are made within like you know a, a country's capital if they also have an opportunity to be able to poach it they are going to poach it because the fisher the relationship between the sri lankan fishermen and the indian fishermen is just not on the fishing resource only uh, during covid 19 and I, I saw this with my own eyes and i wouldn't have believed it otherwise uh, in the north in certain places just where your eyes can see there were indian boats that actually came and transported kerosene uh, milk powder milk powder packets and a lot of the other items that sri lanka was not having access to because of our economic crisis last year but in the in jaffna the northern province of it it was almost like there was no issue there were fisher folk who actually asked me why are people in kanambo with such a sad face what's wrong with you and this is a converse, this is a question that we probably asked the northerners back during the war and i, I really didn't understand what the why he actually answered is like i came to colombo recently all of you look so sad and it struck me i'm like it is true we are sad because we don't have milk powder we are sad because we don't have the moisturizers we are sad because we don't have the road logs whereas in the northern province everything was there so much so that my uncle who lives there knows how much i like milk tea actually said just tell me how many packets of milk powder you want i'll get it i thought he was joking but when i actually said oh five he actually sent me five so the the dynamic between the fisher folk is just not on the fisher in, in the fishing resources and you're absolutely right it is also a political issue they keep it alive i think from our side and i can speak for that too there can be it is also in the sri lankan government's interest to have somewhat of an anti indian sentiment in the grassroots so that when india actually makes offers or makes demands that the sri lankan government doesn't want to cater to they can use that anti indian sentiment in the in the, the fisher issue and say if we do this they are going to actually be angry about it so there is no solution to this because even last year there were agreements made but last week we had 22 more fishermen arrested so I, I you know i'd be lying if i said that i i know of a solution to this but in terms of views you put the fisher folk in a room without the politics they are probably friends because they know they've actually exchanged the cigarettes with c they've actually exchanged the kerosene with c but when the politics actually of it gets involved it, it becomes a lot more murky and there is just no solution in sight we will have this fight for years to come with no solution thank you much for the very frank answer and i think that brings this session to a close okay thank you so much for uh, your patient uh, listening and also for questions from the students here I would like to thank the chair and the speakers for the engaging and educational presentations. I now, rec I now request the chair to felicitate the speakers, Dr. Sophia Kam. <laughs> Professor Dr. Arjuni Subramanian Raju. Having said that, we will now move on to the first and only panel discussion of the conference, which is on the topic Building Bridges Indo Pacific and Global South. This panel will be chaired by Ambassador Anil Vadwa, IFS retired, former Secretary East, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India. This panel has an ideal mix of expertise and experience. The esteemed panelists who will be joining us are Mr. Sridhar Krishnaswamy, Editor in Chief, New India Abroad, 
Dr. Nanda Kishore, MS, Associate Professor, Department of Politics and International Studies, Pondicherry University, and Mr. Omar Rajarakum, Factum Foundation, Sri Lanka. I now invite the dignitaries to the dais. This topic. Um, this is this is a topic which is on building bridges, <coughs> Indo-Pacific and the Global South. Uh, now there's a lot that we can say about this topic. Uh, throughout the day, we've been talking about cooperation, um, how that can happen in various fields. But um, essentially, we have uh, a bit of a focus to this one, uh, this topic today, because uh, this also happens to be the last topic. And we're trying to see if we can give it a little orientation, which is strategic and geopolitical. Uh, so um, let me just start to give you a few points, and then after that, I'll ask the panelists uh, to do that. We have a, um, uh, a rise of China in the region uh, and uh, that has happened economically, it has happened militarily and then we have had subsequent events uh, which have unfolded in the recent past. So that's in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea, in the Taiwan Straits. But there is no doubt about the fact that the Chinese naval presence and diplomatic influence in the Indian Ocean, in the Western Pacific and the Arabian Sea has led to a competition between the United States and China on the one hand, and the reaction which has come about, which is only natural, from the literal states on the other. These reactions vary uh, depending on the circumstances and the threat perceptions that the states have, uh, um, depending on where they are placed and where they are coming from. Most countries in the Indo-Pacific, and we discussed this earlier, uh, can be termed as those belonging to the global south for whom investments and development aid are necessary prerequisites for their survival and for their well-being. So, the Chinese BRI has been talked about quite a bit, uh, and the lending policies have been talked about and discussed, uh, which nevertheless come with no strings attached and ask no questions of the recipient states. Uh, they are generally welcome, uh, even though these may be harmful in the long term. So we have seen many examples of this happening in South Asia, in Southeast Asia, and in Africa. Nonetheless, if we have to have a counter-narrative to this, that necessarily demands that first we must have an alternate source of funding, uh, or alternate sources of funding, and investment for connectivity and infrastructure are made available to the countries of the Global South in the region. And secondly, a recognition, and this is in the words of Prime Minister Kishida of Japan, uh, when he, uh, which he outlined in his speech for the future of the Indo-Pacific, Japan's new plan for a free and open Indo-Pacific in New Delhi in, uh, on 20th of March 2023, uh, of the different strategic perspectives uh, existing in the Global South. While many in the United States um, and its allies or partners believe that international rules and norms based on liberal values should be defended to maintain the existing international law, global South states see those values differently because of differing historical and cultural backgrounds. This resonates with their long-held long skepticism uh, about political value judgments, value arguments, such as dichot like dichotomic classification between democracy and autocracy uh, that has been pushed by the so-called liberal democracies uh, in the region in the past. So it is for this reason that in all the statements, if you notice that all countries have expressed support for ASEAN unity and centrality, and India and Japan in particular have started to emphasize the importance of synthesizing the free and open Indo-Pacific and the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, which happened around 2020-2021. So while Japan has focused on implementation of the free and open Indo-Pacific and ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific with four priority areas, which is maritime cooperation, connectivity, UN Sustainable Development Goals 2030, and economic and other areas of cooperation, rather than pushing its own uh, liberal political values such as democracy and human rights on Southeast Asian countries, the Indian approach has never been prescriptive. Uh, it has on the contrary been one of non-interference and, and 
intolerant of the political systems and practices <laughs> of other countries, especially those of the global south. Now, the Indian approach to the issue of Ukraine uh, has been in consonance with the majority of the ASEAN states, and this is very interesting. We are very cautious about naming and shaming tactics and the imposition of economic sanctions uh, by the United States, Japan and Australia and other quad partners. Again in Myanmar, the security dimension of a restive and a porous border uh, with Myanmar prevents India from cutting off links with the military regime and forces it to keep the channels of communication open while for countries like United States, Japan and Australia, democracy and human rights become paramount. So given the US-China technological decoupling and geo-economic competition, India and the Indo-Pacific countries are looking uh, for means to diversify economic risks, which becomes an additional incentive for them to strengthen ties with each other. Uh, now Japan, very interestingly, has promoted the concept of Asia Zero Mission Community. <coughs> this happened on the sidelines of the G20. And Japan, as chair of the G7, introduced the concept of the G7 and G20 with cooperation from India, the 2023 chair of the G20 for the realization of carbon neutral societies there. Uh, an important framework offered as an alternative to the Chinese um, uh, dominated trade linkages in the region like the RCEP has been the IPEF. And we've talked about that as well. The Indo-Pacific Framework for Prosperity which is led by the United States. Now this framework uh, has not kept pace with initial expectations. Um, why? Because the US has little to offer in terms of market access and Asian economies are actually balking at labor and environmental standards in the IPEF <laughs> uh, This is a reluctant United States has made progress on an early warning system for supply chain disruption and improved cooperation on decarbonization. There is some headway in combating corruption and tax evasion. <coughs> the US, however, has not been able to push data globalization as it draws up tighter rules for technology companies. So IPEF is expected to be a drawn out process considering its ambition of uh, creating a value-based trade alternative to the tariff-based RCEP. Economies of the Indo-Pacific are being, close, being pulled closer into the RCEP despite misgivings. ASEAN is increasing its dependence on China and European economies are individually raising their engagement with the world's largest trading bloc. The center of gravity of world trade is therefore shifting towards the Indo-Pacific. Indo-Pacific states prefer cooperation to geopolitical and geoeconomic competition that would divide the Indo-Pacific. For the Indo-Pacific <laughs> states, it is impossible to either decouple from China or to weaken economic links with the United States. The countries in the region, therefore, must focus on a free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, which considers the global South countries as important in shaping a new international order and respects diversity and inclusiveness and openness. In 2019, India had advocated the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative at the East Asia Summit in Bangkok. Now, the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative advocates an open and inclusive and non-treaty based global initiative for mitigating challenges, particularly in the maritime domain, uh, through mutual cooperation and respect. That has seven pillars of cooperation and is based on strengthening its mutual engagement with the region uh, and strategic partnerships with like-minded nations. India also works through the mechanism of SAGAR, which was mentioned in the beginning today, security and growth for all in the region, to endorse a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, India's engagement with the Indo-Pacific partners is based on multiple platforms like bilateral, plurilateral, or multilateral, and a host of other domains like the blue economy, maritime connectivity and security, disaster management, and capacity building. But as Indonesian Foreign Minister Retno Marsudi uh, put it happily at the 12th Daily Dialogue, and I quote her, building bridges means narrowing gaps, overcoming difficulties, connecting countries and improving relations. One thing we need before we build bridges is to nurture strategic trust to 
manage the strategic competition and board. So to talk in detail about the subject today, we have a stellar lineup of Mr. Sridhar Swami, Editor in Chief New India Abroad, Mr. Nanda Kishore, uh, Associate Professor, Department of Politics and International Studies of Puducherry University, and Dr. Omar Rajaratnam of Factum Foundation, Sri Lanka. What I'd like to do now is to ask them to introduce uh, their uh, thoughts uh, briefly in three, four minutes, and then we'll open it for the, a discussion. Thank you. Let's see how I'm going to do this. Um, when I look at the uh, Indo-Pacific, and if I were to look at it from a global south perspective, I am only reminded of the different uh, security environments that uh, principal countries in the region face. For example, the strategic concerns of India in the immediate context pertains to South Asia. And the strategic uh, context of uh, Japan primarily is in East Asia. So when you look at something called the Indo-Pacific, you cannot simply look at it only from a China prism. <coughs> you know, it is, uh, yes, China is an actor uh, in South Asia, in Southeast Asia. If you ask the Chinese, uh, as what somebody said this morning, they are center of the universe. The name China is a Jung Hua, Middle Kingdom. You know, that's what even the Chinese character, if you see that, it is portrayed in such a fashion. So they would like the whole world to dance around them. You know? But that's not how other countries would want to dance. Uh, because when you look at a country like, uh, uh, like India, yes, China is a major source of concern. We have a bigger source of concern called Pakistan, um, whose uh, chief uh, uh, hobby or something happens to be terrorism, cross-border terrorism. And then um, uh, this terrorism, India will say, is a global problem. Yes, it is. You know, yes, it is. But uh, you know, when you look at uh, in countries like Canada and uh, and the United States, uh, they look at terrorism differently when it suits them. You see, and they, I don't have to get into that part of the thing right now because I've written on it. You know, for them, you know, anybody can spew anything about anybody else. And that will come under free speech and expression. You know, it's okay. Somebody is asking uh, for the Air India planes to be blown up. Somebody is calling for, uh, they put bounties on Indian diplomats' heads. And they ask, uh, you know, kindly let us know where this fellow lives so that you can go and throw a few petrol bombs in his house. All those things are supposed to be free speech and expression. Okay. No, but that is not how other countries, you know, look at it. You know, Japan looks at China differently because uh, you know Japan has also got to factor in North Korea. You know, it's just not you know China alone. There. North Korea is a very good friend of you know China. You know, likewise, the Australians have to look at China differently. You know, everybody is worried about the economic angle even the Chinese. And I'll tell you one more thing too, after having served in the US for a very long time, uh, if the Chinese agree to play ball with the Biden administration, Biden will simply drop China as a threat like a hot potato. Because for them, their interests are more important than what anybody else sees in, a, in any other part of the world. Yeah, um, thank you, um, Ambassador. Thank you also, um, 
Dr. Sridhar. Um, I see the very idea of Indo-Pacific as an opportunity for India from the perspective that I think we were both talking about South Asia, South Asia and South Asia. There's nothing that was moving and it was all about our own neighborhood and people pointing at uh, us asking that what have you done in your neighborhood if you're not able to manage your neighborhood, where else you have your aspirations, where, you, where else you want to go. I think for India this just came like a very good opportunity to go beyond, uh, get into a new narrative and also perhaps explore and then uh, bring down this whole tension about talking about South Asia all the time and then managing its relationship because it simply boiled down to even if we say South Asia, it would just boil down uh, between India and, and Pakistan. I think for, for India, uh, which was always saying that I, I want to be a global player but that cannot be um, happening after I set my house here right in, in South Asia and it was unable to express this one to the world and I think Indo-Pacific came as a perfect opportunity where the players whom it wanted to convince, they themselves wanted it to be a linchpin. They themselves wanted it to be a player and it just worked out, um, probably the constellations just worked perfect for India and I think that opportunity India has seized and it's, a, it's been able to uh, contribute in, in whatever way it is possible from pedagogy to everything. It's been able to use that where it's pushing institutions, higher education institutions to look at opportunities in the Indo-Pacific for taking relationships there. It's also looking at uh, security operations, it's looking at economic integration, it's also looking at everything. But at the same time, when it is keeping the whole uh, thought on the Indo-Pacific at the ideation level, it also knows the limitations uh, as of now. Uh, because though everywhere everybody is talking about there is some sort of a saturation. It also has no capacity to take it forward or push the narrative beyond a particular level. So simultaneously, it's also working on many other forums. It's also working on several other multilateral, minilateral to all lateral institutions that it wants to look at. So for me, it sounds like it, it is it's perfect time that India's ambitions and India's uh, what do you say, the way it wants to explore and launch itself in the world order, uh, Indo-Pacific has come as an opportunity. Probably I will stop it here. Thank you, Thank you uh, Brothers and uh, Dr. Nam Kishore and uh, Mr. Sridhar as well. So, I can actually talk about, uh, I want to actually highlight the Sri Lankan example again because Sri Lanka was actually in the middle of this entire geopolitical dynamic of being stuck between India, China and US. Uh, the perfect example being the port city of Colombo which actually is known to be one of the biggest Chinese investments in the region. Um, when the opportunity actually came and there was an idea for it, the Sri Lankan government in fact offered the opportunity for India to also be part of that or for India to develop the, the reclaimed land or reclaim that land to be able to build it. But at the time, perhaps for whatever reason, they thought that this was not going to be very profitable or lucrative and from the Indian side it may have been right, but what really came after that was something I really think both India and US were not prepared for. Because the level of media attention that the port city just alone got was unprecedented to a point that there was a lot of fierce psychosis that was being built around, or oh, how bad is this project going to be? Of course, many would also argue even today, after the project is complete, we still have, the project itself has not managed to have considerable investment from any external actor except uh, the US that has pledged nearly about a $500 million facility there. So uh, in my view, I feel like, because we're, I'm also the only one from a small state uh, on, on this, uh, on the panel, so it's, it, it, it'll be, I think with, as small states, we also need to be very practical about our bargaining power and our position in this entire international system and the dichotomy, like Dr. Brazil Bagbo was actually mentioning, for us to think that we can somehow chart our own path as like a small, beautiful nation without actually having India's blessings, uh, that's to live in cuckoo land. I mean, it's, I know that's not diplomatic language, but the reality is also that. 
And frankly, our president, the current president now, President Ranil Vikramasinghe, and the one who was ousted, President Godabe Rajapaksa, had really realized this by the time they took office. Because in both of their initial statements, they mentioned something that was very unique, but also very, very, very loud and clear. That Sri Lanka will not embark on anything that is a national, that is uh, a, a violation of India's national security interests. The message couldn't actually be uh, be clearer. But I also feel that doesn't mean that as the bigger power, India also needs to be taking the smaller states lightly or their interests a bit lightly. Because, yes, it is one thing that we rely quite a lot on India and we will need to rely on them, keep continuing to rely on them. But the world has also moved to a point where there are enough options for smaller states to also pick from. The consequences of that is going to be fairly, fairly grave. Um, let me actually put one of the best, ex uh, one of the best most pertinent examples. When, uh, in 2022, when we had our economic crisis, one of the biggest reasons why we why it led to the ouster of a president was because we didn't have fuel, we didn't have essential food items. And if we did have some food item that can be transported, we still didn't have fuel to take it around. So one thing uh, that at the time when we actually, you know, we just re realized how dependent we were on India's assistance and like somebody pointed out before, nearly 4.2 billion was actually given to us by the Indian government that actually said, okay, this can go to this credit line, this is for health, this is for fuel, and everything like that. But after we got out of the, not that we've got out of the crisis, we're still in the crisis. One thing that our president has also done fairly well is liberalize the energy market or the energy players in Sri Lanka, which before we only had the Sri Lanka Petroleum Corporation and the Lanka Indian Oil Company. Whether there was agreement by US or India for it or not, we've also invited China to set up Sinopec there. We've also invited US to be able to put up our parts there. So it, I mean, in a nutshell, what I'm actually trying to say is that for Sri Lanka or any smaller state, it is, it is fairly, it is part of our fate that we are going to rely on the big brother or the big power, right, adjacent to it for guidance. Uh, but it's also down to the big power to make sure that we are not taken too much for granted because once we get hurt, that also kind of means that we'll have to start looking for other options. And it's in the big power's interest not to actually uh, put us in a position where we have to look for those options. Thank you. also reminded me there's a second part to this discussion which is cooperation between North and South. So if the panelists would like to add something on that, uh, I'll give you a few minutes to just uh, run on that. So uh, the one on the North and the South, I think, um, and I had this on the presentation but I'll, I'll repeat it. The clarity for the Global South really came, in my opinion, at least late last year after the Russian um, uh, Russia war on Ukraine, uh, was from the Indian External Affairs Minister, Jai Shankar. He made three, three statements which I thought really set the stage for Global South leadership under India. One, uh, of course, in an interview where he mentioned um, to, uh, a, 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 I don't know whether it was a European reporter, but definitely a Western reporter who was trying to confront him on not abiding by the sanctions. And he said, well, Europe's problems are not the world's problems. That was number one for me in terms of clarity that came from the global south. Number two uh, was in another position where in the same interview or something else, they were also trying to say, oh, you have a very difficult relationship with China. What does this mean? Do you need help in resolving that? And his answer was, Yes, we have a difficult relationship with China, but India is perfectly capable of managing it on its own. That to me was clarity number two that really came from India to and, and the Global South, which actually said this. Number three was actually during his uh, UN General Assembly speech, in which he said, uh, the days that a few nations will set the agenda are over. And that was also a fairly clear point in terms of where India 
uh, or the external affairs minister actually wanted to see the global south and global south's leadership and prior to that although i myself have been in four hours where i thought I, I wished india actually took a stronger stand on certain stuff in the last year or the last two years that has really come to uh, a, a resolution so i feel like these uh, this very strong posturing on India's part has also suddenly made the global north realize that there is no journey to be embarked upon with an India that is so careful and so clear with what position it wants to take and with what level of leadership it can offer to the global south. That has also put the global north in a bit of a predicament, um, like previously was mentioned, they don't like to lose that bargaining power, but the loss of that bargaining power has already happened. And I think that's a good start for the Global South leadership. Thank you. Um, something very interesting is this debate on the Global South and North bridging the gap has been there for a very, very long time. Bit of nomenclature from third world to developing and these type of things have only changed. I was reading some of the literature of the past, uh, in the 90s, how a lot of scholars on international relations and others used to write. Then also, the first component uh, or the common issues that they've all mentioned was interesting that then also it was technology transfer. They, then perhaps the reliability uh, was, was on agriculture so much that the only request from all over the South, whatever that the imagination that we have as a South, though there's no fixed definition about it, was all that the technology from laboratories should move into industry and from industry it should move to the farmers. This used to be the constant uh, component that all of them were asking for, but yet there was none in the south uh, who was able to provide this one and I think that continued to remain, which is the second issue where they talk about obsolete but tenacious economic, legal and social barriers. I think because we, the first one is not fulfilled, I think the second component is very, very clear that the economic component is not working. When the economic conditions of the global south is not uh, becoming better, people would not simply recognize us or they would not re re what is the respect us. This is the same case that happened with India. India resisted opening up to globalization. It opened up and then there was this, um, what do you say, the capital inflow and then perhaps a lot of other things started changing. And then the global north normally started interacting with us much, much better than that's where I think we moved from being, even with the United States, we moved from being estranged democracies to engaged democracies. I think that's how the narrative started changing, a lot of things coming. But strangely, one of the questions that uh, regularly has been put up is that India is trying to take this leadership and say, um, we want to be the leader of the global south. At the same time, India also pronounces now, how is this differentiation? Or they see this as a dichotomy. First, you are telling you are part of the larger uh, entity and you want to be part of that one. And then suddenly, uh, you also talk about something else and you want to be a leader of that one. What exactly is this? This is the question that has come in. Now, for me, I see the first one as more of an ideational factor. I see that one as more of an idealistic posture that India wants to put up and say that we don't discriminate between anyone. All of us have to uh, leave for each other from climate change to everything. There is a greater agenda that India has. At the second level, I think it's very pragmatic saying that not everything happens from there. We need to be on our own. We need to work on certain things that are supposed to be. That's why India continues to have this engagement, which is robust one. This is another thing that some of the countries try to uh, have tried to problematize and say, that India says it, it works with the Global South, it wants to be leader of the Global South. Look at its engagement with the West. There's such robust engagement on a daily basis. Look at the type of uh, relationship that they are sharing. I think India wants to see this relationship between or its investments or its strategic behavior and everything between uh, India and the West as complementary rather than, uh, let's say, uh, in competition. I think that's the first thing that India wants to put across. Second is that the division that we see whenever we are talking about uh, bridging the gap and invariably uh, what Omar was also highlighting is the alternate that is available to them and that alternate 
he is an ideological problem is what is pursued by a lot of people but to be precise india has no ideological issue with china if that but to be the case perhaps we would have not been even talking to them since the beginning in fact uh, whether it is sherbindo or whether it is uh, uh, nehru all of them who have who had some sort of an understanding with china somewhere felt that they were all good people it's a great civilization invariably all their writings talk about it and india also did not have this idea uh, sorry the uh, ideological factor even when uh, mao zedong was there india kept on talking about it india wanted to have better relation everything was same but i think these cartographic aggressions are the one which have perhaps complicated the relationship where india is much more uh, worried about those components if that were not to be the case uh, the prime minister would not have gone to an extent uh, immediately after he assumed prime ministership he would have not gone to an extent of bringing him all the way to sabarmati then to mahabalipuram here wanted to have better relation i think he made his effort he made everything that was possible on plate but subsequently uh, as the chinese are known to i think they want everything to be at the end what we call as the with chinese characteristics that that's a problematic one anything whether it's global order it has to be global order with chinese characteristics if it has to be democracy with chinese characteristics if it is uh, rule based world order with chinese characteristics i think this obsession with the idea of chinese characteristics is the one that's that is working as an irritant and my way or highway is the biggest problem here and to that i find prob- what probably professor chaudhary was talking this noon uh, saying that somewhere we need to segregate and say that china doesn't become part of the global south i think that that if it comes as part of the discourse at least beginning from now it is not that we need to stop uh, what is a having relations with china or shunt out china that is not the idea here at least in something that we are talking about where an amount of compatibility is required where china would work as an irritant where china would work as a negative alternate that's available for people like omar we need to make that very very clear and say that china doesn't become part of the global south which are just because of its economic prosperity to whatever that it has achieved so far in competition with the united states whatever the condition is third is india at this juncture if it's talking about global south i think it has come from some sort of confidence that it has brought in and that confidence is where it is able to provide an alternate when i say alternate people have witnessed a uh, bombastic program such as bri to which again india stood as a stumbling block had india said yes to it perhaps chinese would have celebrated it to the next level and chinese would have uh, enjoyed it because bri is essentially a chinese character and india would have fallen into that tra- that particular trap now india rather than only criticizing bri and not giving an alternate would have put india in a spot saying that well, what type of alternative that india is able to provide in the global south india the way as i mentioned in the morning as well uh, the engagement that it has with multilateral institutions and it's able to emerge in the global south as a leader beyond uh, what has been seen so far i think that itself is a humbling experience which i which i see as an alternative that is available to bridge the gap but as i said in terms of the tangible outcomes i think there is a necessity from climate change to everything uh, because uh, in the morning i also said that india is comparatively a resistant power india is also a reluctant philanthropist there when i say let's say something like refugees india hasn't accepted to be part of the uh, 51 convention or the 67 protocol we are not been but our record has been impeccable there's no doubt about it from somalians to afghans to you you name a refugee there here we have done all that part but at the same time we are not ready to be part of whatever again i would call it as that rule based world order in which some amount of commitment is also required but yes for sure there has to be setting an agenda and target put certain things in progress for the implementation of the agenda and third monitor the enforcement and progress i think india fairly has brought in um, some components where it should uh, it, it has thought that it should not ignore Uh, and either the climate refugees or the vulnerability of the pacific islands i think prime minister's gesture to visit some of those pacific islands and then being with them it, which has never happened before i think that itself shows that india is committed much beyond um, just the visits and other things including uh, giving vaccines to some of those states which perhaps otherwise would not have been a possibility i think india could move beyond the methodological nationalism that is associated with 
things like vaccine and many other things where there was an amount of criticism within the country uh, saying when you are not able to give a vaccine to everyone, why are you hurrying up to give it to others, other people? That, that we saw as a soft power, whether it is Guyana or to the Pacific Islands. So many of them spoke about it. I think that for me is bridging the gap in the global south, which India has been slowly and steadily doing. It's taking baby steps. It's not that it's able to phenomenally take a leap. There's no catapult here. But at the same time, what it's able to do is clearly making its footprints, which is pragmatic and perhaps for me uh, would go a long way. I think perhaps the Prime Minister has been lucky to have some people at least who are able to push what I call as the polemic, push the narrative properly and at least speak the mind to which we had these inhibitions for a very, very long time. We were fearing, or if I say this one, what would the other one think? If I say this one, what would the other one think? I think we have gone past that situation. For me, that is the first step in bridging the gap in the uh, uh, global south itself. Sir. Thank you very much. So we have a lot of uh, ideas which have uh, been thrown up by the panelists. And I would encourage the audience now to not only ask questions, but also Comments are welcome. If you want to talk about some some of these issues yourself, and uh, you are most welcome to do that. Yes, sir. You have a tragedy of China, according to me, during recent years, it had become a status quo power like the United States and other capitalist countries. China, which stood by Vietnam and in Olympia said, live to teeth, that China is no more. It is really supporting the most reactionary regimes, the military regime, the Adhivakshi regime in Sri Lanka, the military regime in Pakistan. The China which is supporting the revolutionary struggle is no more. And that, according to me, is a great tragedy. The second point that I would like to make is, I think more than any other leader in the world, Nehru was conscious, more conscious than others, <coughs> in the differences between China and Russia from very early times. In 1952, just about for the US ambassador in India, he used to meet Nehru regularly. And in his book, New Dimensions is Peace, New Dimensions in Peace, he quotes Nehru as saying, a country so intensely nationalist as China will never sub be subservient to Russia for long. A country so intensely nationalist as China will never be so subservient to Russia. So he knew, along with Kishman, the differences between China and Russia. He knew the half exchanges which took place between Khrushchev and Chini in Bukhara. He knew how the border conflict was related to what was happening elsewhere. So when the aggression of China took place in October and November 1962, Nehru did not call it as a communist aggression on a democratic India. Nehru called it as an expression for the expansionist designs of a strong China, which enabled us later on to get support from the Soviet. Today we do not do such the tragedy of the Indian academic scene. So we do not discuss about what is going to happen in Nava neighborhood ten years hence. We are all experts in doing post mortem on the path. And I think this seminar at least should generate this curiosity. We will be wrong, but we should try to embark upon what is going to happen in Myanmar today with democratic struggles. Or will New Delhi again support the military regime as it did? One as, as it did when <coughs> the was foreign secretary and we reduced our support to all in a famous speech after her release 
Aung San Suu Kyi spoke about with more sorrow than anger about those days when her father used to be the guest of Jawaharlal Nehru and various other things. The Sir Martin Hussain said, "The darkness everywhere will darker till not continue to remain for long. The sunrise is inevitable, and it should be for us." to be with this sunrise. Okay. Would anyone like to? Yeah. That's right. Uh, thank you, panel. Uh, just one question about the Indo-Pacific. The Chinese narrative is that it is just an American game plan uh, to contain and encircle China and they say it's a colonial thing and you know we have to have our own regional uh, arrangement. We should not bring in these outsiders like the Americans. But now a lot of countries have announced their own Indo-Pacific outlooks in our region. Uh, so I would like the panel to reflect on this idea of Indo-Pacific and in fact it was rightly pointed out it was uh, Shinzo Abe of Japan who conceived the idea. It is not an American brainchild at all actually. But how do we um, take ownership of the idea of Indo-Pacific? You know, we have also small country represented on the panel here, big countries. All of us uh, are now announcing outlooks and strategies for Indo-Pacific. It's sufficiently decolonized in that sense. It's not really a US led even when Trump and his isolationist policies were there, we wanted to go ahead with the Indo-Pacific. You know, it is not necessarily driven by the US. So uh, in our own countries also, I think in the region, we need a different narrative to make sure that it is an indigenous Indo-Pacific. So any thoughts on how we can develop that narrative in our countries? is not just about uh, balance of power, right? It's something that we should all own and feel from within that this, this new construct uh, is right for the current era and it is good for us and for our people. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to you. Um, any of the students at the back, uh, and I see a lot of them leaving now, uh, but uh, before you leave, would you like to say something or ask a question? On this table here? benefits being part of Indian Ocean, but then and it is a part of Indo-Pacific, what kind of benefits India could see and particularly being part of Quad. And we have witnessed this uh, uh, Doklam crisis, how the members of you know Quad were reacting to that. The third reflection could be on Global South, how India is going to be seen as uh, as as a representative uh, voice or representing global south if you look at when india failed to look at sark and india blames pakistan because of pakistan sark was not able to achieve but then at the same time if you look at it bimstek where pakistan is nowhere but somewhere bimstek is also not going to be seen as a kind of a sign for achievement so how do we navigate this idea of uh, our ability to lead any organization and also look at uh, how we are not part of uh, 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 BRI and then we came with the proposal AAGC with Japan but somehow that did not uh, you know come to the reality so how India is going to look at to lead this global south in future I think we need to have uh, kind of, a, you know, a, 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 a homework to do before we are going to lead any organization. Thank you. Okay. Commander Vasu. First of all, I must compliment Ambassador Vadu on this excellent panel for putting across this so well. It is one of the most productive sessions that we have had. 
some random thoughts on uh, the discussions. You know, the first part of your discussion, you know, spoke about the relevance of geography in terms of you know whether India should confine itself to the Indian Ocean region. These questions were not asked in these terms, but it was conveyed to say, you know, what are you trying to do? You know, why are you not managing your own borders here in your neighborhood? And you are trying to reach out to the moon. So no, something of those lines. But the point here is, it's also related to what uh, Professor Chalia brought out as to what should India be doing with the new relevance of Indo-Pacific. As he brought out, every country, European or otherwise, has an Indo-Pacific outlook. You now that means it's become important. For India, it's important not only because of your uh, activist policy, but also because of the trade and commerce that goes through the the east, uh, the, the western part of Indo-Pacific, right out to Siberia. We are not also looking at the connection between China and Vladivostok. So therefore, you know, the new significance of this uh, you know, construct should not be lost on observers. So therefore, when you look at the new dynamic India that is assertive, I know as also brought out by, I was very happy to hear, uh, you know, our friend uh, Omar quoting uh, uh, our external affairs minister. That means he's been taken note of in terms of uh, a new chapter for India, I would say. In the sense that, you know, we are assertive, we, you know, re-emphasize on the need for strategic autonomy. We are not going to align with any nation, A or B or C, including the Quad. And I think every partner of the Quad has made it very clear that it's not a retro type of an alliance. Has India derived benefits because of the uh, of those which stemmed out of uh, the, the Quad? Like the IPF, uh, the IPF, IPOI, STEM. There are so many things that have come as advantages to India and the other participants. Should we be denying ourselves just because of China? Is another factor that we need to look at. China, uh, you know, obviously, as was brought out by speakers and also by Nandi Kishore and others, you know, continues to feel that it is the center of the universe. That's understood. It's a given. And your professor Shri Krishna may try to translate it <laughs> and say, yes, it's whatever, Jung Ho, or Gung Ho, or whatever. It's Gung Ho. Right. <laughs> so the point here is that China cannot be removed from the global map. We'll continue to keep adjusting with China. The fact that despite Galwan, we have 121 million, which everybody quotes and says, this is the kind of trade deficit that we have, how do we manage China's relations? The point is that, you know, recently there is a track to dialogue. Uh, this is only for uh, within these four doors. You know, there is a lot of concern in China. We were there just about 10 days ago. There is a lot of concern in China about uh, India's actions and uh, the impact that it has on China. China's economy, China's dealings with us. China's visits to India, their investments in India. So there are many fold ways in which we seem to have hurt them because of our relations. It's not that, you know, it's a big thing. The point is that in relations between India and China, the bilateral relations have been affected and there is a global angle to this. And India uh, rightfully is trying to use the Indo-Pacific angle to try and not contain China. We can't contain China. It's a huge economy. But to try and send some message to say, you better become part of the global order. No, that's why we come back to the rule-based order. No, if you are, if you are uh, part of the, the global economy, the global structures, the United Nations, then let's come to terms and start behaving. So I think there are many lessons in this bridging the global north, south, whatever, with the Indo-Pacific. Indo-Pacific will continue to be relevant. Many people might like to discount and say, there's nothing more to Indo-Pacific. And the Chinese initially tried to dismiss by saying it is a froth on the ocean, you know, which will dispense in time. So it's not happened, it's only consolidating its position. There are greater things which are getting added to the Indo-Pacific. And therefore, I look at it as an excellent instrument for India to work through and, you know, add on many, many more things here. Just not the quad, but the other things which are there seems to have given us a lot more results out there. So I thought I'll just share some of these thoughts uh, on, on the first part of your thinking about whether India should worry about only its own backyard, which is the Indian Ocean region, or should it also be stepping out to to other parts? Right? You are growing, you know, you are a leader in, in your own uh, this. So therefore, let's reach out and use this opportunity. I think the panel also brought out this as an opportunity that has presented itself. If you are not making use of this opportunity, then we miss the bus. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> so uh, before I uh, hand this over to the panel to answer, because there have been three. Uh, different interventions which require answers. But on the you know second uh, question, 
uh, one particular uh, one which I would pick out is the Asia Africa Growth Corridor. Uh, so let me just uh, say that this is a concept which was never owned by the Japanese government. Uh, it was a study done by RIS in New Delhi along with area and it was sent to MITI which is uh, the Japanese ministry which implements this concept uh, uh, for consideration and they did not uh, endorse it because they felt that their value chains were all based in Southeast Asia and they could not actually relate to this concept at all. They would rather work with India and other countries in Africa separately. So uh, Asia Africa Growth Corridor is an idea which is talked about only in India and is talked amongst the academic circles. Uh, and we have uh, never endorsed it at the government level, neither at the Japanese. Just wanted to clarify. wanted to find out from you, Mr. Chairman, since you are asking the panelists to respond to our comment, whether I will get another opportunity to make another comment later yes. or may I make it down, sir? No, no, we will come back to you. Okay, um, just a reflection on uh, talking about multilateral organizations or any forums. Perhaps for me, at this juncture, no forum is impeccable or no, no forum is doing absolutely phenomenally great. That's the first part. Second is also any time any uh, leadership is taken up or any initiative is taken up, uh, three P's become very, very important. I call them a three capital P's. That is power, politics and perception. Now, wherever there are other members, we respect them as sovereign states. We don't have control over the way they perceive power. You know, India tried a lot to do. India's dilemma has always been the same in South Asia. If India does something proactively, they call it as big brother attitude. If we don't do it, then they will say India is not able to do anything in South Asia only. Where else it will do? You know, what is the middle path that has to be? Right? And uh, this is one of the concerns. So, how they perceive the idea of power within and from the external is not in our hand. That is the first difficult part. Second is politics. We anticipate and we start something by thinking the other side politics will be conducive to us, then they will have regimes that will be supportive of us and then we start an initiative. And if internally they are weak and then they collapse, or they have some other push and pull factors due to which there is a regime change or there is an authoritarian regime that comes in or there is a leader who just has no intention to interact at all. Classic example is, is Bangladesh. Right? We had uh, Kalidasiya and India was, uh, first of all we were getting, uh, we were bleeding with thousand cuts from the Pakistani side and the Chinese were trying to do so, then Bangladesh also joined hands. But then subsequently from 2009 onwards, Bangladesh has not been a headache and neither India has perceived Bangladesh as a headache. In fact, there was a point of time where the United States said that the elections are rigged or elections are not to be considered. What is happening in Sri Lanka, sorry, Bangladesh is not acceptable. India stood by Bangladesh and said, but well, because for India, pragmatically from the real politic perspective, having a stable government, somebody who doesn't trouble us on a daily basis in Bangladesh is much more important than uh, anything else or the success of uh, SARC in which you may have to sacrifice much more. That was one of the concerns. So that is the second part of it. Same is the case with Nepal. They got, uh, we did not anticipate in 2008 that they will get rid of the monarchy and then they will try experimenting with democracy and then subsequently now again they have come on the road asking let the monarchy only take over, we have had enough with this experiment with democracy. And they have not been able to arrive at even a constitution, that is not India's problem. So their power, perception of power, their politics and third is perception that is the only thing that we, sometimes it helps us, sometimes it doesn't help us. 
Prime Minister goes to Nepal. He is seen like Hindu Rude Samrat. He is seen as a hero. And they throw flowers on him. They receive him like a hero. And then subsequently, because of their constitution, there is a Madeshi problem there. And then overnight, they start thinking India is the one which is meddling with everything and India shouldn't be doing anything. And they start burning the effigy of the Prime Minister. So the perception changes in just few months. So power, perception and politics, all the three have their own <coughs> reach and they have limitations. What India perhaps has learned over a period of time is that for a very long time it was thinking about the extent of power. But now what, is, what it has understood is the limitation of power, which is also very, very important. Unless we understand the limitation of power and certain times ignore that and leave it. That's why with Pakistan it, it kept on engaging. Every time we would put a hand, every time we would make an effort, every time we would get bruises and then we would make an effort, in return give, they will give lot of other things. And then at a point of time it decided I will not interact only. In fact there is a scholar called Felix Gross. He says not having foreign policy is also a foreign policy. He says that's a very clear decision that a country has made. And I think India took that path that I will not have a foreign policy with Pakistan, let it be, and nothing has happened, and India has lost nothing, and they will continue to do whether you feed them on a daily basis, you continue to talk to them, you have Aman Kiyasha, you do anything with them, they will continue to do the same business, their character is not going to change, and what does India derive out of it, at least it's peaceful comparatively, it need not deal with all these things, be trails to everything. I think that's how countries mature, that's how countries learn about it. And I think India has tried its minds. There was a point of time where even there was an accusation on India because Sark has been proposed by Bangladesh, India wants to spoil it. I don't think that was ever validated. I don't think that, that stood, I think India made all its earnest effort to survive it or save it, but it just did not happen at all. That's why any initiative taken here, India comes up with COVID-19 fund and Pakistan asks us a question, we need to have an audit that why should India only collect the fund? Now with that sort of an approach where you say that even if I lose two eyes, India should lose one eye. Perhaps uh, I don't think that's worthy of, of spending our time and uh, effort in, in diplomacy. I think that someone uh, like Ambassador Vakwa is much better qualified to speak about the, the, that aspect than me. But that's my perception about multilateral forums and India's engagement and India's leadership as such. I think India is learning now. India is learning a lot of things which perhaps, as I said, something, uh, some things were uh, inhibitions, we did not put the art of dehyphenation. All those things we are learning. That's precisely why we did not have uh, a premier of the institution, or sorry, you know, country or the uh, president of the country not visiting Israel at all for a very, very long time, even after restoring diplomatic relations. I think it's, it's all about the time and this is a leadership and we need someone who can, who can, who knows where the brain is and then they know where to put it into use, I think we'll be in better place. No, I, I have always, uh, you know, there's been a lot of change in the way South Block has been functioning over the last several years. And uh, one of the first things is that uh, India has become more confident of itself. Um, you know, uh, I remember when uh, I, when I was covering Southeast Asia in the 90s, um, Prime Minister Narasimha Rao visited, and he was a wonderful man. I knew him even before, and um, so I casually asked him. Uh, sir, what are you, you know, what have you gained out of this, uh, you know, visit? You know, he was visiting Vietnam and then Singapore. And then he pulled me aside and he said, never ask this question again. Never. As a journalist, you should never ask this. Because what happens when I visit a country and go back, you ask me, what are you taking with you? And then when a foreign leader comes visiting India, I have to ask, what have you bought for me? You know, and he said it's a very dangerous, see, like that, you know, there used to be a time when the only thing that India, uh, Indian media fellows were interested in, for every visiting foreign dignitary, only one question, will you support India at the Security Council? That's the only question they will ask. 
and you know what you know i could have given that answer no fellow is going to come to india and say i won't support you so that answer was very very obvious but now the media has also grown little confident we don't need to ask anybody you know we need to be invited to the table and the stage will come in which we will be same thing with the epic you know we were never yes with the epic i attended the first epic summit in seattle 1993 as a journalist and uh, everybody at that time they know what is epic without india what is epic without india and there was a lot of opposition and ambassador wadwa will know that within southeast asia many countries didn't want us on the table then okay and they had this something called consensus everybody had to agree and there is always one fellow who will disagree and i don't want to mention the name here you know there is always one one or two people you know who will disagree no they will quietly say no this is not the time and they give some you know talk a baby you know you know i mean excuse something you know but now you know we are not they gave us observer status okay you know we never you few shaga uh, goyal who was just there for that epic meeting he even go around the in the visiting every day the president prime minister please let me in please let me in you know those days are over you know likewise in the pacific india is playing a very very you know quiet but effective role it does not mean that we have to put out a rain as vikrant every day and you know patrolling the seas that no we don't have to do that but uh, we have risen up to a level that's why i always you know tell everybody every audience that i lecture you know what do you have to keep your mouth shut and pay attention to economic growth because that is what is going to take you places you know your lecturing your hectoring and all the stuff is not going to take you anywhere you know we have to focus on economic growth you know and don't depend on anybody for heaven's sake <laughs> you know uh, you know suddenly we buy a few american weapons and everybody says no dump the russians go the american way uh, and yesterday at dinner i was telling somebody you know it takes only one senator in the us to put an anonymous hold on anything I remember that during the civilian nuclear deal, when I was in Washington covering the civilian nuclear deal, and there was, they were supposed to be voting in the Senate one day, and nothing happened. Then we were, you know, as journalists, we were, you know, running from pillar to post, finding out what is happening, what is happening, and then some fellow tells me, one senator has put a hold. I know who it is, but I can't tell you. That's even worse. you know and then i mustered courage and i wrote reportedly i put you know very careful i was working you know for the pti at that time reportedly and immediately i got a call from that senator so how do you know it was my senator who put it i said no, reportedly you want to issue a denial that you didn't no he won't you know so it, so it's a lot of things you know one person can put an anonymous sword then what happens you buy a bunch of f16s or f35s from there and suddenly in some war with somebody you need wiper blades so you won't get it you won't get it because one fellow has put a hold on it one out of 535 <laughs> you know so these are all the things you know so we have to grow india has grown a lot thanks to people like ambassador robert you know you know we it's not question of acting tough you know you know it's a question of you know one of the first things in foreign policy somebody said not having foreign policy itself is foreign policy one of the first options you have in foreign policy is to do nothing do nothing <laughs> that's what kennedy did first option they gave him with the cuban 
missile crisis. Okay, good. I find it. So, one of the first options that Kennedy was given of the 6 7, first option, do nothing. Hoping that uh, the passage of time, the crisis will go away. Of course, it didn't go away. It lasted for two weeks or something like that. But, you know, what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, you need to, you know, build yourselves, build ourselves, you know, before, uh, you know, before we can expect miracles. Thank you. Thank you. We, we need to close this session now because we've run out of time. But, uh, sir, you wanted to ask a question or make a comment, so you have the last word. visit Southeast Asian countries fairly regularly in the 1980s and 1990s when I was associated with the University of France. In my meetings in several universities, I used to point out that China is one country which has used force to buttress its territorial claims against India in 1960 against Soviet Union in 1967, 68, against Vietnam in 1979, against Philippines in the mystic Philippines. So at that time, my point of view was appreciated. During my recent visit, when I say that China, what I have said earlier, Southeast Asian attitude towards China has eradicated. In its Autobiography, Doctor in the House, Dr. Mahathir says, who says China is an expansionist country? That is an American propaganda. In the campaign for winning friends and influencing people, China had done really good things at the right moment. Take the case of the rubber rice agreement, which China signed with Ceylon in 1949. UN regime was deadly anti-communist. So they signed the agreement. Rubber was bought from Sinovan and rice was supplied. Rubber price was fixed at the highest price in the international market. And the rice price was fixed at the lowest international price. In 1974, when Tulu Dulu the Malaysian Prime Minister, went to China and established diplomatic relations with that country, which was followed by other ASEAN countries in China. They came, the trade agreement was to be signed. China said, we do not want to give the impression that the Chinese traders in Malaysia should make profit out of it. The Chinese insisted that Chinese goods should be sold to cooperative societies formed by the government. One more thing that I want to say. During the Deng Xiaoping years, when the economic liberalization took place, maximum foreign direct investment came from the overseas China. In his memoirs, Lee Kuan Yew mentions his first meeting with Deng Xiaoping when he told him, we came from the poor part of China, southern part of China. But by doing the hard work, we became prosperous. We today own 4% more the national wealth of China. And he gave them suggestion, Go King Street, who was really helping China in its economic transformation, how to start the export promotion zones. And the Chinese, overseas Chinese capital went to China. The policy towards overseas Chinese has both economic relations as well as political relations. So long as it remains economic, no problem. But once it takes the political lower tones, then it creates problems for China. During the Olympic Games in Beijing, in all the European capitals, the flag was booed for the human rights violation. But when it came to Southeast Asian capitals, all the overseas Chinese in these countries 
and he's behind China. They did not, there was no problem because most of the countries were also pro-China at that time. But if it takes political overtones, if the OC Chinese are asked to help China against the interests of the countries in which they live, China's policy towards overseas Chinese and Chinese foreign policy will end in Myanmar. This is what will happen in 1952 in Federation Malaya, 59 16 in Indonesia, 65 66 in Indonesia, 77 poor people in Vietnam. Wherever and whenever the Chinese has supported overseas Chinese, overseas Chinese has occurred more and the China's policy has also ended in this one. This is a lesson for us. Our people in Southeast Asia are very poor. 9% of the Indians in Malaysia own only 1.5% of the natural wealth. They don't have money to invest. And not really that, unlike the overseas Chinese who love China, would like to invest in China, the Indian capitalist class story is very different. You may recall Ambassador Wadhu in the 1970s, the State Bank of India opened a new scheme where the overseas Indians were allowed to open their accounts in dollars, earn interest in dollars, and withdraw in dollars. And when we faced the economic crisis, there was a mad scramble to withdraw this dollar account. I recall I.G. Patel, they were in the Raj Bharadur Shastri Memorial Lecture in India International Center in Delhi. An overseas Indian may have his arts in India, but he would love to keep his money in the Swiss bank. So the Chinese model and the Indian model are very different, and we should study them in greater detail, especially the students, so that we can. Last point, if I may say, so we have lost many opportunities in Southeast Asia for building friendship. In yes. August 9, 1965, Singapore, not without reason, was separated from Malaysia. Within three hours, Lee Kuan Yew called Thomas Abraham, who was at that time his commissioner, and who later became high commissioner, and told him, we don't have an army, we don't have an air force, we don't have a navy, you support build up the army. New Delhi, Delhi Diary, Dal Bhadur Shastri was the Prime Minister. Lee Kuan Yew wrote a letter to him, Delhi Diary. And then the Singapore went to the Israelis. Israelis were called initially as Mexicans in Singapore. They don't only feel accepted they were, they were the Israelis. Lee Kuan Yew came repeatedly to Delhi when the British were withdrawing from the base. He requested Lee Kuan Yew, why don't you use the base for building ship, ship repair? When the Singapore Airlines are started, they asked the Air India to help in the technical personnel. Today, Singapore Airlines the best airlines in the world. So many agents. In later years, they had lots of capital, they wanted to diversify their investment. They had entrepreneurial skills. They wanted to invest in Tamil Nadu. Then Chief Minister Jayalalitha, according to unimpeachable the highest source in Singapore, he wanted bribe with dollars to be invested in the Hong Kong Bank. Yes, you're right. So we've learned a lot from come a long way since those days, and uh, thank you for recalling and uh, recounting all so those uh, missed opportunities. We must do a plus and minus. <laughs> Where have you gone? What can we do? And if we do that, Still, there is scope, lots of scope. There's a lot of good will for us, and we are not seen the thing. I recall a speech made by Tien Kao when I was a student. None of the Southeast Asian countries look at India. India has imperialist design, unlike Japan, unlike China, unlike Soviet Union, unlike Britain, unlike France. And that is a plus point. And Kishore Madhuri, we invited all the ASEAN people for the Republic Day Parade. Shri Madhwani said, nine countries in Southeast Asia are culturally indebted to India. Shri Madhwani is wrong. Nine and a half countries are indebted to India. Because in Vietnam, 
there was a Fudan, there was a Champa, both of them highly Indianized states. Yeah. That again was a plus point for us. So I think we should take all these things into consideration and open a new chapter, but it should not remain in the form of five, either in the South Block or in the lectures by Supreme Marine in various schools. Thank you. So I think uh, we have to close the session now. Uh, we we well over time. Thank you very much for participation, panel, and thank you, the audience. for the panel, Ambassador Anil Vardha, and the distinguished panelists for their profound arguments and astute observations. I thank the chair for having moderated the session efficiently, a special mention. I also thank the members of the audience for, an, you know, in, uh, for all the interesting discussions that was made earlier. So with that, we have reached the valedictory uh, session of the One Day International Conference on Shaping and Synthesizing the Voice of Global South Coast uh, G20. Due to time constraints, we have to, uh, and as well as we have to vacate the room, we will be moving on to vote of thanks. So, a pleasure to invite Mrs. Madhumathar Agraman to deliver the vote of thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure uh, to deliver the vote of thanks uh, again today. Um, so first of all, I'd like to extend a very, very big thank you to all the speakers who came today. A lot of them came from outside Chennai as well. So thank you so much for taking the time to do this for all of the students and all of us. It was a very valuable learning experience. Uh, next, I want to come to the audience who have been really remarkable and have uh, raised so many challenging questions. I think, uh, I think the speakers must have been happy also, I'm sure. So it was a really good, engaging audience this time. And I'm very happy about that. Thank you. I'd like to thank all the distinguished members of the Chennai Center for China Studies for always being a big, big support to the team and supporting all our events. Uh, I'd like to thank the serving officers who took time out of their busy schedules to be here today. The, uh, and any friends from the media who are uh, still here with us, thank you so much for remaining till the end. Uh, I'd also like to thank our internet vendors, uh, Impress, who have uh, handled the technology part of the conference today so well. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, Residency Towers for being.